computer. Um, D Dimitri, if you can hear me, your, your sound is actually on. So I think you might need to go on mute, Dimitri, because your, your sound is um, interfering a little bit. Okay, I hope he heard me. Okay, so let me just share my screen. I'll just share my desktop. And okay, play from the start. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. I'm Jeremy September. I've done my introduction already. I'm a lecturer at the University of Hyogo, just moved here this month. Today, I'm talking about long standing uh, Japanese community currencies. It's a, basically an extension of the talk I did at the last conference. Um, I've basically just, um, I think at that point, I had investigated about eight of the organizations. Um, I've got 13 I'll be talking about today. Um, I was assisted by Professor Shigeto Kobayashi. He's not with us here today, but his input was invaluable uh, to this project. So I'll just start by doing an introduction uh, regarding why I'm interested in this um, area that I'll be discussing today. Just give me a second. I uh, just need to adjust something here quickly. <clears throat> So I'll just start with an introduction talking about my general interest in this area of long-standing Japanese community currencies. Then I'll get into the research purpose, methodology, and the findings. I'll try not to get bogged down too much in um, the theory of it, um, but there are some aspects I do need to discuss. Um, I think it should take me about 30 to 40 minutes to get through everything until the findings at any point. If you have any questions, if you want to stop me, if there's a point you want to discuss, by all means, uh, feel free. And then number five, there are just two points of interest. So I'll get to the overall findings of the project. And then there are two points of interest I'd like to discuss. One is regarding Japanese LETS systems. So anyone out there with experience of, you know, Western LETS systems, I'd really welcome your input. And the other is a community currency in Japan that I'm, I'm, I guess I'm quite excited about. I really like what they're doing and how they're doing it. So I'd like to uh, touch on that. Okay, let's get into it. So I started my PhD 2017, around about 2016, 2017, I was very interested in Japanese community currencies. And I'd read a lot about them in the media and in research papers. And I started, when I started my research, I looked on websites like this one, it says you on the top, Chi, Kitsuka, Zen, Risto. So it's like the list of all the community currencies in Japan. And I get so excited, you know, clicking on these websites. But then, you know, each link I clicked on, there was just like URL not found, site can't be reached. And if I did um, get hold of an organization, maybe they didn't pick up the phone. So I was finding a lot of dead links. Um, and even the organizations that I'd read about in the media and in research papers that were, you know, having an impact and that were apparently doing kind of well, a lot of them were also sort of no longer circulating. And it was at this point that I, I found it seemed to me there was almost like a divergence between impact and longevity. So you'd have these organizations that were actually impactful according to, you know, research papers or, or media but despite the impact, they still, you know, they didn't last for a long time. So like it meant that even if you were impactful, it didn't guarantee longevity. And that's when I started thinking about kind of the importance of long-term management of a community currency. And so there's just a couple of points about that I want to talk about. Firstly, it's just, you know, I think generally with a community currency, you want to embed it into the community. And I think that naturally that will take some time. For example, Izumi and Nakazato, they did a 2013 paper about a currency called Peanuts. It's a let's type currency. It's been operating since 1999. And in the paper, they talk about how with Peanuts, it took six years for them to establish certain aspects of their network, to kind of establish a foundation from which they could grow and develop. So it's very clear you, you really need that time. So you really need to think long-term, or at least mid to long-term. Uh, secondly, this is around about 2016, I wasn't finding a lot of empirical research on the management of community currencies. I was finding a lot of organizations, both in Japan and in the West, 
um, a lot of like successful organizations would publish books on how they did it, but it would normally be purely from their perspective. And it wasn't, you know, the, the, the level of empirical investigation wasn't quite as, you know, strong as I would like it to be, you know. Um, and then finally, I found that uh, the, the research on community currency longevity was limited to North American and European contexts. And those are the four papers I'm referring to. So I thought, well, it would be interesting if we also had a contribution from the Japanese side of things that we could combine with these other papers and get an idea of, you know, what does it mean? What does it take for an organization to, to kind of operate over the long term? Just to clue you in a little bit about the state of Japanese community currencies, this, is, this was a longitudinal study by Izumi and Nakazato. My apologies for the Japanese. Um, basically, it was a study from 1999 to 2016. So from 1999 to 2008, they did a yearly survey of you know, newly created community currencies in Japan. And they, they did this 1999 to 2008 it was every year. They, you know, checked in on these currencies and then again in 2016. And their estimate of the number of community currencies created is it's a little bit more conservative than some other estimates. Um, but what they found was that of the 389 currencies in their data set that were created between 1999 and 2016, 20% continued operating for more than 10 years. So I thought, well, that's, you know, that's not insignificant. 20% is quite a healthy percentage to be going over 10 years. So I thought, well, let me look at some of these, you know, uh, some of these 79 organizations and, and try and see what, what did they do? Is there anything we can learn from them? And so my research purpose was to formulate concepts that could describe the operation of long-standing Japanese community currencies for the understanding of researchers and social entrepreneurs. So for researchers, just so you know, researchers around the world could get an idea of what's happening in Japan and compare it to what's happening in their own country. And for social entrepreneurs, you know, if, like for example, if I ever found myself speaking to an interested social entrepreneur, what do I tell them? Right. What useful information can I give them regarding the long term management of these organizations? So that was my goal. I did a I used the grounded theory approach. It's largely a qualitative research methodology. It's generally used for the discovery of theory from data. And it's especially used in areas that are perhaps under researched. So, for example, I sometimes my research sometimes takes takes me in the direction of nonprofit organizations. And I think there are some areas of NPO theory that just have so much background literature and theories and concepts created, right? Um, that you wouldn't need to create more theory or more concepts. However, I think with, when it comes to community currencies, it's relatively under-researched. And so I thought the grounded theory approach was a suitable methodology to kind of create a new concept. It's also the most widely used framework for analyzing qualitative data. And I thought um, using qualitative data was useful because I was interested in the experiences and perspectives of these social entrepreneurs. And also many, uh, about half of these organizations didn't really have any quantitative data in terms of currency issuance and you know, usage that I could really use. So these are the 13 organizations that I examined. As you can see, all of them have been operating for more than 10 years. Um, Peanuts is the one that's been going the longest, 22 years. Yorozuya and Omusubi Currency, they've been going the shortest, 11 years. The only one that is no longer operating is Earth Day Money. That stopped in 2016. All the others are still going. Um, and so I've noticed recently when I'm searching online, there are a lot of the, basically, sorry, apologize again for the Japanese, that says cheeky denshi money, um, uh, local digital money, 
So you're seeing a lot of these local digital monies. You guys might be familiar with Saru Bobo coin for those that came to the conference. So I'm seeing a lot of these um, digital local currencies popping up now. Um, and it's certainly very exciting. Honestly, I'm not sure how many of them are just kind of point systems and how many of them are like the genuine community currencies. But the currencies that I'm dealing with now don't include many of these newer ones obviously because I'm focusing on ones that have just gone for 10 years or more. However, there are two digital currencies amongst the ones that I am examining. This was my data collection. <clears throat> I had five uh, points of data collection. Number one, uh, recorded and transcribed interviews, interviews by email and fax, currency data reports. These are basically just you know numbers on how much was issued and how much of the currency was actually used. Some of them are over like a long period of time. I went to four or six of these currencies where I took part in a volunteering activity or I attended a meeting or a festival. There were various uh, means of observing. And finally, I did three um, currency, I did three surveys on the users of these currencies. Now, my primary data set were the interviews. I applied the grounded theory approach to these interviews. I had nine hours of transcribed interview. It comes, comes to about an average of 40 minutes an interview. Now, initially, my interviews were actually quite short, mainly because I didn't have these free-flowing interviews. They were more structured. And also, some of these organizations are actually quite simple. But I found as I went, when I got to about organization number five or number six, the interviews became longer and longer as I uncovered more you know, pertinent information. So towards the end, all the interviews were basically going over an hour. And then what would happen is the organizations that I interviewed first, I would have to go back to them kind of to ask follow up questions. And that's where a lot of these typed interviews came in. So I would send like five or six follow up questions. And with some of these organizations, it ended up being more of a correspondence than sort of a one-time interview. <clears throat> but basically, this was my primary data set, and then the currency data reports observation and the surveys were supplementary. They were just used for data triangulation, just to confirm certain findings. Um, and so that was a 13 organizations. I collected the data, I applied the grounded theory approach, and then I created a conceptual framework that describes the management of these organizations. <clears throat> now, when it comes to grounded theory, um, there's kind of, you know, when it comes to the research questions, the research questions and the methodology are kind of enmeshed. So you start off with your general research questions, you select your research site and subjects, collect the data, and then you interpret the first bit of data that you get. And then you do some conceptual and theoretical work. You start organizing the data. And then you maybe have a tighter specification of research questions. Because the idea with grounded theory is that you go into the field with as little preconceived ideas as possible. So I, I had like, for example, I, I had a vague idea I wanted to look at. Does the environment influence it? Is it the demographics? of the users, you know, is it, to what extent is funding important? So I had all these vague ideas. And through this kind of repetitive process, you, you know, change your research questions a bit, you collect more data, and this goes around and around. And I, that, I went through that process several times. So I'm just gonna talk about two aspects of GTA to explain to you how I arrived at my research questions. So the first aspect is theoretical coding. So when you take the interview data and you turn them into categories, you organize them into categories or themes. And that was a three-step process. So the first step, I would have some open coding. So I would take an interview line by line. And when I came across a pertinent piece of information, I would create a code. Um, so, for example, here, this code, Steiner Academy attracts families to the area, right? So, this was an interview with Yorozuya. Yorozuya is a rural uh, community currencies. So, this first code 
talks about how there's a school in the area that attracts many families to move to that area. And then later on the interview, we said, you know, there are many migrants, many people moving from the city to that area. And then he adds later on most Steiner Academy migrant families join the community currency. So I would create a lot of codes like that. And I had about 1,400 over all the interview data. Next step, axial coding, you organize those codes into categories. So for example, these three codes were organized into the category whereby it became clear that migrants, people moving to this town were influencing the community currency membership. Um, a large portion of the community currency members were actually from out of town. And so that, that would be one category. And then the final stage, selective coding, it's where if several community currency data sets share a similar category, it becomes a core category. If it is something that is observed over many organizations, it becomes a core category. So I had two core categories that I identified. All this happened, I used Max QDA qualitative data analysis software, and I actually organized the codes and categories in Excel. This is just one small part of a sprawling Excel data sheet. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but basically I organized the data from 1,400 codes to 118 categories. And finally, I had two core categories, which I think are kind of the main, uh, the main concepts that describe how these organizations have circulated so long. The second aspect of GTA I want to talk about is theoretical sensitivity. Now, when you are creating these codes and these categories, obviously there's a lot of subjective decision making there. Um, and so it's of course important that you are firstly knowledgeable of the field and that you have experience. So what the, the background literature tells us about theoretical sensitivity in GTA, they say in combination with theoretical appreciation, which basically just means an understanding of the background literature. Researcher insight and experience are vital components to theoretical sensitivity. So you need experience in this field that you are analyzing. Now, I've only been researching community currency for about four or five years, and that's where my research partner comes in. Uh, Shigeto Kobayashi, Kobayashi, uh, Professor Kobayashi, has been researching community currencies for many years. And of course, even more importantly, he's a native Japanese speaker. And so the way it worked was that I would conduct the interviews and I would then analyze the interview data. And then I would send all the data to Kobayashi Sensei as well as my analysis. And he would review both the data and my analysis. He would review it and then we'd have a meeting. And then he would point out perhaps where there was a linguistic misunderstanding or a cultural misunderstanding. He also, he was, I mean, he was, I mean, it was just so, he, he in addition to, you know, correcting any misunderstandings, he also suggested follow-up questions because he was actually very familiar with some of these organizations. And he was able to find very good supplementary data. So for example, there was this one organization, <laughs> Hirari, and this organization had lost their city funding. Their city funding had been canceled. And the organizer was of the opinion that no, it had been a political move. And the organizer was very angry about this. And Kobayashi Sensei was able to find the minutes of the city hall meeting um, where they had been denied funding. So we actually got both sides of the story today. So there were a few points like that where he was, his input was just invaluable. And so because of his input and his kind of review of the data and my analysis, I'm quite confident um, that the concept we've come up with are accurate reflections um, of the data. So this is, these are like the top nine categories, the most common categories that we found. And core category, leadership continuity. All 13 organizations had the same leader or leaders right from the start to the present day. And these organizations are quite varied, right? Some of them have a yearly budget of, you know, $350,000 or $500,000. 
and others have a budget of less than $1,000 or $500. Um, some of them are digital currency, some of them are paper currency. So there's a wide bit of variety, but all of them had leadership continuity. So that was undoubtedly um, a core a reason behind their you know, longevity. And then secondly, of course, secure funding. You know, that we could have probably said that even before the investigation. And we can see that secure funding was linked to having a connection to a business and institution and a cross-sector partnership um, with the local government. There was another interesting concept, migrant-centered rural networks, where the let's organizations in rural areas were basically maintained by people that had moved to that area. It was not maintained by locals to that area. It's not really a core category, but it was interesting. And so it was very clear that leadership continuity and secure funding were the two core areas that needed to be explored. And consequently, those were my research questions. How is leadership continuity achieved? And what are effective long-term strategies for resource or funding procurement? Now, these might seem obvious, but there were a number of other things such as you know, the demographics of the currency users, what kind of currency users, or, you know, the local environment. And none of those things were actually uh, strong determining factors of how long these organizations survived. A lot of it came down to the leadership. So before I discuss the research questions, I just want to contextualize these organizations for you in terms of their human resources and funding requirements. So you can see 10 of them, um, 10 organizations only had volunteer staff. There was no paid staff. And further one to eight had yearly expenses less than $10,000 a year. With Earth Day money and beach money, they were unknown. I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable. I, I had a feeling in the interview that it would have been maybe a bit rude to ask them about that. Um, and then number 11 and number 12, Sarari and Hirari, they had a yearly budget of about $100,000. Uh, Hirari, $510,000, three paid staff, five paid staff. However, number 11 and number 12, the staff salaries are mostly unrelated to community currency activities. With number 11 and number 12, the community currency was a subdivision of their nonprofit organization. The community currency was a complement to their paid services. And finally, number 13, almost would be currency, yearly budget of $350,000 for paid staff. And this is a pure community currency organization. Um, this is actually the one I want to discuss a little bit more later. Very interesting organization. So I think traditionally, Japanese community currencies have been focused on social capital development, social development, and not so much, um, you know, economic development. And this can be seen, you know, these are all very much grassroots organizations. And then number 11, 12, and 13, a little bit bigger, a little bit more organized. Okay, so how was leadership continuity achieved? So when I examined the leadership continuity of these organizations, three models of leadership emerged or three models of community currency emerged. Firstly, we have pass book communities, which are let's organizations. Next, we had cross sector tools. And finally, mission focused community currencies. So I'm going to discuss each of these now. So firstly, pass book communities. With these organizations, the leadership is sustained just by personal fulfillment and a very low leadership burden. Um, these organizations are very easy to run. The administration and funding requirements are quite low, 500, I mean, yeah, let me just think, I'm trying to translate it from Japanese money. Uh, so like 150,000 yen would be, yeah, about $1,500, $1,000 a year. And the reason why, so these are all lets, right? These are all mutual exchange currencies, you know, pluses and minuses, right? And the reason why their administration and funding requirements are so low is because all of them use a passbook, which is essentially a bank book. Um, so from what I've read of, you know, European and British and Western lit systems, all of them are kind of 
con they have central control, right? Um, all the 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 um, transactions are generally reported to a treasurer that monitors kind of everybody's accounts. With Japanese lead systems, everybody gets their own book. Each person is responsible for their own uh, transactions, for recording their own transactions. And of course, that eliminates a, a huge amount of administration. So the people that are the main organizers don't have to, they don't have to print money, they don't have to exchange Japanese yen to currency. A lot of the transaction work is in the hands of the users. And so you basically, when you join, when you, when you set up a passbook community, all the new members get a book, and then you just have regular events, meetings, or simply just a mailing list. One of the most successful Let's organizations, um, Yorozo, yeah, they don't even have events or activities. They've just got a mailing list, and everybody just contacts each other over that. And so consequently, these are very easy to run. And so again, personal fulfillment and low leadership burden. So it's easy to, you know, run those over the long term. Secondly, we have cross-sector tools. Cross-sector tools are a lot more complex than the passbook communities. And here the leadership is sustained by low maintenance governance of a well-supported community currency network. So what, is that, what does that mean? Basically, each of these organizations, Toda or Sarari and Atom Currency, have an agreement with a larger institution that provides them with human resources and funding. Not a lot, kind of very minimal um, funding and human resources. And then the leadership is an executive board. And this board meets once a month. So I'm just gonna show you some of the details. So here we have Toda or Atom Currency and Sarari. So each of them have modest funding or the provision of a funding instrument. So for example, Toda or receives $7,500 annually from City Hall. They receive that money, right? A little bit of funding. Atom Currency, a little bit more complex. How many of you know the cartoon character Atom Boy? I think it was very popular during the 90s. I think they made a movie about it five years ago, but it's more or less an internationally recognized character. And so the company Tezuka Productions, it's kind of a manga, it's an entertainment company. <laughs> they give Atom Currency a 99% discount on the character licensing fee for this character. Now, normally you'd pay about $200,000 a year to use this character. But each of these community currency branches, they only pay $2,000 a year. So it's like a massive discount. And because they have now the rights to this very famous character, they can use that character for advertising and earn revenue in that way. Finally, Sarari just receives $5,000 annually from the local government. So each of these has a bit of funding or a funding instrument from an institution. And then each of them has an executive board. And the executive board for each of these organizations has been there right from the beginning. So all the board members understand the mechanics of these currencies really well. And they just meet once a month and make decisions. And then the real donkey work is done through um, human resources that is either borrowed or really modest. So for example, with Toda or the executive board makes decisions and then city hall employees do all the administration work. Printing of the currency, you know, printing of pamphlets, advertising, anything to do with running a currency. City hall employees do all of that. With atom currencies, stakeholders, um, you know, these stakeholders, normally local government or NPOs, they, their workers do the um, administration work. And the reason why these stakeholders do the administration work for atom currency is because of the, the famous um, kind of character that is associated with atom currency, sometimes you would have um, a municipality that will request atom currency in their city. They'd want to have this local currency there. And therefore, they'd be willing to let their workers do 
the administration work. It's a little bit complex, but um, basically they get they they volunteer their admin. And then finally, Sarari. Sarari is actually they established a non-profit organization with three employees, and one of those employees runs it. So this um, these cross-sector tools are quite they're quite complex, but all of them have the same thing in common. They have an agreement with a larger institution that provides them with funding and human resources. And then the leadership just has to make decisions. They meet once a month or once every three months. And that's why these people can stay in. That's why they're willing to lead these organizations over such a long period of time. And there's a lot of retained knowledge um, with these executive boards, which really helps. And finally, mission focused community currencies. Now, these are sort of the real social entrepreneurs. These are the people that are really dedicated to um, these organizations. Earth Day Money, Omusubi Currency, both had very uh, mission-driven leaders. Same with Beach Money. Tama and Hirari, these two, number four and number five, they started as cross-sector tools. They had agreements with the local government, but they lost their funding. And after that, the, the organizers said, well, we've lost our funding, but we are determined to go ahead. And so they just kept pushing. And so the, the key aspect of these organizations is that if their leadership was to resign, those organizations would cease to be. Now with cross-sector tools, they've got, you know, um, formal processes in place to change leadership. Torda or recently has started bringing in younger board members over, you know, of, as part of a sort of long-term change in leadership. And with passbook communities, the, the leadership burden is so low and the admin is so low that, you know, someone else taking over wouldn't be too much of a thing. But these organizations, if their leader was to resign, that's it. That's what happened to Earth Day Money. And it's important to point out that all of these organizations, or none of these organizations have had to go through a leadership change, which I think is a, a pretty big deal. We don't, we don't know if any of them will survive a change in leadership, but I think these are most likely to fail in, in that case. Okay, and then secondly, what are effective long-term strategies for research or funding procurement? And so firstly, these passport communities, their funding is very basic, membership fees. You know, members pay um, 10, thousand yen yeah thousand yen like ten dollars a year and that's enough to keep them going because their their funding and admin uh, requirements are quite low however when it comes to cross-sector tools and mission focused these are the four long-term uh, secure funding um, sources local government funding corporate social responsibility funding where a company uses the community currency as a means of giving back to the community. So they, they sponsor the community currency. Um, Non-NPO subdivision, where the organization is a subdivision of a nonprofit organization. So for example, Hirari is a, is a, is a, um, a nonprofit organization that focuses on the care of elderly and disabled people. So they have their professional nursing services for taking care of these elderly and disabled people. And the community currency is a supplement to that where they have private citizens coming in and providing care in exchange for the currency. Um, and then market funded where the community currency establishes a market like a farmer's market. And through vendor fees, they're able to receive in many cases, in some cases, a very good um, income. And so when we look at the leadership continuity, or how leadership continuity is sustained and the funding mechanisms, the leadership continuity and the funding mechanisms, these explain how these organizations have survived over this, you know, 10 or 15 year period, right? So it explains survival. However, amongst these organizations, there are some that, have ju that are just surviving and there are others that are thriving and really growing and developing. And so I was interested, what's the difference, right? What, what are the factors that separate the ones that are thriving from the ones that are just surviving? And that's when I uncovered these impact factors. So firstly, with these passbook communities, this one here in the middle, these passbook communities are incredibly efficient and flexible. They are so easy to set up. 
um, you basically, you can have just a group of 30 or 50 people. They join, you give everybody a book and let's meet once a month and just talk and hang out and exchange with each other. And these past book communities, like for example, one of them, Mayu has 180 members, whereas um, Eurozia has 1,100 members and growing. And so with Mayu, those 1,100 members, that's in a town with a population of 10, small town with a population of 10,000 people. So you've got 10% of the town's population and it's kind of growing. And then you also have Peanuts, which has, um, it has about 4,000 registered members, although not all of them are active. Um, but it's also, they also have a digital a currency. So what, what, what you find with these passbook communities, they are incredibly flexible depending on the ambitions and the amount of resources that the social entrepreneur can call upon. If you, if you kind of have low ambitions, you just want to meet with a bunch of people and, you know, have a platform for exchange and connection, fine. If you want to expand it bigger, include some businesses, you can also do that. With um, cross-sector tools and mission focus, there were three aspects that were key. You have to have exchange with the national currency. There were some that didn't have exchange with the national currency and all of them their exchange, their circulation kind of just kept going down and down and down. Um, and then business evangelists, very important. Um, some of them, for example, Atom Currency, they originally just had one branch in Tokyo and they were happy. They were happy just having that one branch in Tokyo. But then there were certain leaders. Um, this guy was the head of the National Association of Shopping Streets or and he was quite an influential individual and he was really kind of motivated and very inspired by the community currency concept. And through his influence, they expanded nationally. And there are many examples where you have these business leaders, not only participating, but actually taking the reins and pushing these currencies forward. And that makes a big difference, obviously. The third impact factor is having a designated community currency market or an area where you can use the currency. Um, that was impactful for two reasons. Number one, it was a source of income, but even more importantly, what happens sometimes, for example, with Earth Day Money, Earth Day Money had 180 participating businesses. Problem is Earth Day Money was in Shibuya. 180 participating businesses disappear in Shibuya. So if you want to use the currency, it's like, you need to look at the map, where can I use it? And you have to, you know, look at Google, or whatever, and it's hard to find these businesses. But if there's one place where you know you can use it, it really helps promoting the currency, the use of the currency. Um, so that was helpful. And it, it doesn't have to be like an actual market. For example, these are five atom currency branches. Um, and this one here, Onagawa. Onagawa is the small town on the East Coast. Um, Onagawa was very badly damaged by the 2011 tsunami. And when the town was rebuilt, the towns, all the businesses were kind of, the, the town center was rebuilt and all the businesses were just um, very centralized. All the shops were just in one area, right? And so the result was that all the businesses accepting uh, atom currency were all in one place. And as you can see, um, on the right, on the left, this is the issuance, how much currency was issued. And on the right, this is the redemption. Or this is, this is essentially um, how much of the currency was actually spent at local businesses. So you can see Onagawa's got the highest percentage of currency that was actually spent. What happens sometimes with these community currencies is that when people volunteer or they take part in an activity and they receive the currency, sometimes they just don't spend it. It just stays in their wallet or they don't know where to use it. But as you can see, Onagawa had the highest um, usage of their currency. And I can't say for certain, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's connected to the fact that everybody knew exactly where to go to spend the currency. And so then, you know, if I was going to be talking to a, an interested uh, social entrepreneur, someone that was interested in starting a community currency, um, I'd firstly ask them, like, you know, how ambitious are you? 
Are you just interested in creating a platform for exchange and connection? In which case I would recommend them just starting a passport community. You can start small and you can expand it depending on your ambition and your resources. You can have a digital, you can include businesses. It's all up to you. So you can have from a hundred people, maybe a thousand people, right? However, if you are more ambitious, if you want to get local businesses involved, local nonprofits involved, um, I would, you know, I would talk about the, the funding. So you can see here with the funding, on the left-hand side, we've got local government funding and corporate social responsibility funding. Those are two funding sources that are very difficult to control. I mean, you can apply to the government for funding, but it's not guaranteed. Right. And the, these this corporate social responsibility funding, the two examples of corporate social responsibility funding, both of those examples came from within the company. It was people working for the company that were looking for a way um, for the company to contribute to society. And they chose, but it didn't. Nobody applied to the company from outside. So I think these two are kind of not reliable forms i mean you can apply for them and if you get them great but i think being the subdivision of a non-profit organization or even starting your own market is something i mean these are not easy things to do but they are much more within they are much they are things that you can actually control for yourself and a couple of these organizations particularly sarari i think um, Nishid, um nishibe professor nishibe was i think he consulted in the creation of sarari and when they created Sarari, they decided to create a nonprofit organization that could be a base from which the currency could function, which worked really well, you know, or you could create your own markets. I would recommend to the social entrepreneur, look at one of these two, you know, ways as a long-term funding mechanism, but I would emphasize um, starting a market, starting a market or having a farmer's market or at least having a concentrated area where the currency can be used because if you do that you will have a potential funding source and in addition to that you will have an area where that you know where the, the circulation of the currency will be um encouraged and i think that's that's all i have to say for now i do have more to say but at this point i just want to stop and and take a breather and just ask any of you if you have any questions um any aspects that you are unclear on, anything like that? Can I be the cheeky one and start with a question? I have a meeting at, at 12 sharp. Go for it, go for it, go for it. <laughs> yeah, is that okay with everybody? <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Uh, I found this super interesting, uh, Jeremy, and Thank very you. well presented, and I really, really like it. And I think you've identified two key issues in community currencies. I'm, I'm really, really happy I, I was here today. I could attend. Thank you. I have a quick question, and it refers to, um, if you can go back to a slide where you showed the, um, uh, I think it was like the pre slide previous to this. It, the, no, no, the one with the table and the, uh, the, the redemption. You actually write redemption. No, the next one. Oh. Uh, I can't remember the name of the of the. Uh, it was Atom. 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 I that. think it was this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that the pre. There. Yes, thank you. So it, it actually because you're touching upon an issue that I'm very concerned about. You're you're talking about as I understood it with, with redemption. I understand convertibility, so the possibility of users uh, that have that currency to go. I don't know where somewhere, whether it's the town hall that is managing these currencies or helping, helping to administrate them or whatever, but where they can go and then get them redeemed for yen, yes. right? Is that right? Well, it's not, um, it's not, it's not redeemed for yen because normally with, with Japanese currencies, the normal customers, normal users can't redeem them for Japanese yen, only, uh, bus only businesses. Okay, so businesses can redeem to yen. Okay, yes. so that was, that, that was a, okay, so that was one clarification, thank you. The other is, um, my concern with redemption is then, of course, that uh, businesses are not uh, encouraged to use the currency among themselves. But in, so instead of pushing circulation, which is what you want with a community currency, they are actually becoming liquidity pools. They are uh, accumulating it and then yes. going to the town hall. And so when you write here that there is 81% of redemption, but yet you say there is 81% of expenditure, it, it was contradictory to me. Mm -hmm. um, 
Oh, you mean con con uh, contradictory? Contradictory in the sense that when I read this table, I read, oh, so 81% of all those 2.9 million uh, yens that it has been issued it are being redeemed. For me, that sounds like there is no much circulating going on. Ah. Uh, but then you say, well, but the 81% are spending it. And, and not, so you mean users are spending it, but then businesses are not circulating it. They are redeeming yes. it. That, that is such a great point. That is such a great point. Um, I'm trying to find, I had another, oh my goodness, this computer is so slow now. Basically, um, I've got another uh, graph where they took a community currency, Genki. And I think they took about, I think it was about 300. They, they, they took a sample of about $300 of this um, Genki currency. This was back in 2012. Because back then it was a paper currency and every time the currency was used, people would write on the back of the currency exactly what it was used for and where it was used. So it was a great way to keep track of how many times it's being used. So ideally what you want is somebody gets the currency and then maybe they exchange it with someone else in time, maybe for, you know, I don't know, that person buys a second hand jersey from them or they, they do that person's garden. So what, so in between in between the person receiving the currency until it is until the business redeems it for japanese yen you're hoping it gets used multiple times exactly. you want you, you want some kind of multiplier effect and what i found exactly. with what happened with genki that actually showed with the genki currency they had they were they were actually eight cycles so i think up until the so I think the first cycle was 100% of the, of the, of the $300 worth was used. And then, and, and then the, the second cycle, another 100% was used. And then there was a drop of the third cycle, only 34% made it to the third cycle. So what you're saying is that businesses were using it to trade among themselves. It wasn't clear. It wasn't clear what it was being used for. Was it between businesses or was it between people? But I, I think, you, I mean, it's, a, it's such a difficult thing to tell businesses, don't spend this currency. And this is actually the, the currency I want to talk about in detail later, which I think is doing such good work, is Omusubi currency. And when I read the terms, because Omusubi currency has about, eight, at this point, probably about a thousand participating businesses, right? Mm -hmm. And I was reading the terms and conditions for these businesses joining the network. And one of the terms and conditions was that they have to reuse the currency they can't just redeem it again or they have mm, they have to use it okay. once or two. but i spoke to the founder and i said listen how do you enforce that <laughs> you know <laughs> how, how do you get these businesses and he said to be honest he can't enforce it at this point but his no. goal is and i mean i wish you could stay well i'll send you the video when i talk about that currency yeah, later i'll contact you i think this is super interesting no man this story. guy this omusubi currency guy is doing some great work and basically he said yeah. listen I want to get to the point where my network, where the network itself has value, right? And he's on his way. Like he's got a thousand businesses. This is, and this is, this is, this is like in, in, a, in a city with a population of 500,000 people, right? And all of these businesses are locally based. So there's no Starbucks or McDonald's involved in this. So his goal is to get the network itself, for the network itself to have yes. value. And once it has value, he thinks he'll have more leverage in um you know uh, asking them to spend it amongst themselves but you know there's nothing much you can do about that you you need to get the value of your network up before you can do anything exactly. like that yeah. yeah but like i like i said there have been examples thank in you. the past yeah but great question thank you thank you jeremy thank you for for all <laughs> for everything my pleasure okay cheers bye sorry i have to leave cheers anyone else <clears throat> I have a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. When you talk about the three forms, obviously I appreciate there's a time component to when these things started and society has changed quite a lot. Now people are moving towards more digital based yes. um, ways of living. So this digitalization as well as digitization. But it's yes, digitalization yes. Like culture. So with the past books, um, I do like the simple way that you can write things down. I, I can contrast it with what I saw for example, with uh, a folk magazine that was done in Lincolnshire. It was mm -hmm. called Fizz Gig, and you could get in all sorts of pubs and bars, and there was every possible gig in there. And it was great. 
could get this book and you could see things. And when they tried to go online, it just died. Because at that time, people didn't have mobile phones, so they couldn't access the information. So when they're yeah. sitting in the bar, they couldn't flick through and sit, talk with their mate about where they were going to go next. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, everything has gone online. Yes. So I, I also see there's a learnership, learning aspect here. Yeah. Have these um, passbook communities moved online? Is there a common software that people are using? Um, so there are four of them. I think I can actually just go to them here. Um, um, um. Okay, so these are the four passbook community currencies. Our money, Yorozo, Yamayu, they are all, they are all only the passbook, right? However, Peanuts does have a digital um, application and they basically, they just pay an IT company. How much do they, I think it's 80,000 yen, which is $800. They just pay this IT company $800 a year to maintain this online application. But um, from my interview with, with the main organizer, he was like, they're thinking of scrapping it because, you know, so, uh, you know, so many things are moving digital and there are so many advantages to digital. However, I, I have found um, that there is still, especially with these passport communities, if you're talking about developing social capital, you know, people meeting face-to-face, -face, exchanging things, there's, I think there's more value with a paper currency or the passbook. Um, so for example, great example. So Earth Day money. Earth Day money stopped circulating in 2016, right? Oh no, they, they, well, they, they kind of, the, the, the system kind of broke down in 2013, but like the last digital transaction happened in 2016. Very interesting. They used to have a monthly Earth Day market. And at this Earth Day market, you could spend the paper currency. And now the digital network, the, one of the main reasons why Earth Day money stopped operating was because they couldn't keep up. They, they basically, they, they didn't have the technical know-how to continue their, on, their, their, their smartphone application. And they didn't, they didn't have the funding or resources to continue their, their application. And so the system just kind of collapsed. And in 2016, I went to the Earth Day market. Now, bear in mind, the system, the currency had not been active. The leaders had not been active for about at least three years. The currency had been more or less dead for three years already. But when I went in 2016, there were still pieces of Earth Day money circulating in this monthly market. Um, and so I think there's something to be said for that. There's something to be said for the resilience of that, for the ease of that. People understand that. So I think that's why these Our Money, Yorozuya and Mayu have gone on for so long and even Peanuts um, because they didn't really need the, the, the digital aspect. I think, especially if you're thinking about building a platform for exchange and connection, digital can be useful, but in my experience, users and organizers prefer um, having the book or having some kind of paper money. And what, what I love about these, especially Eurozoia, I mean, Eurozoia is still growing. You know what I mean? Um, so digital is great, but I think there's still some room. There's still a lot of value in having a passport currency if you are looking to develop a social capital. Does that, does that answer your question, uh, Marcus? Yes, it does. It, uh, I mean, I think, again, it's a, um, a generational thing. Uh, another generation that's quite used to using WhatsApp and Facebook and um, maybe they want to go away from lots of writing things, might find a nicely written app that would suddenly capture the market and everybody would use it. Yes. But we don't have that app. And so we, if we have plenty of software that doesn't work very well, people won't use it. But you, but you um, know, the, the, this, is, this is the problem that Earth Day Money also ran into, and it's something that Peanuts doesn't like about the application. It's just the cost. That's what's great about these passport community currencies. The cost is, it's like, for example, like, like I said, out of these four, Eurozia is probably the most active and most successful in terms of people constantly exchanging with one another. They don't even have a, a yearly membership fee. <laughs> They've just got the members join, you pay a joining fee, and that's, uh, their budget is ridiculously low. And when they started Eurozia, I mean, this is, the, the, it, it, it was started in conjunction with a, what do you call it? Um, it's the same as Brixton Pound. What do they call those? Um, transition towns, right? It's a transition town. Um, and they were like, listen, we worried about, you know, maintaining this thing over the long run. So let's just keep it as simple 
as possible. And so it, it just works, you know, it's just very, very simple. And I've, I'm actually really impressed by these passport community currencies. And I think just there's another Hey? Yeah. Yeah, me too, I really like the idea of it. And I also think there's another aspect. Everybody says, oh, you must modernize, oh, you must digitize. And other people don't want to modernize and digitize. Yeah, but um, if you, it, I mean, again. Going strong, and we have cassettes that people still like to use, people still like to play vinyl. Um, and in some ways those things have risen because yeah. they're not, they are more human. I, I think it's, it's, it's more human, but I think it's more just a cost factor. It's just a cost factor. If you want to have a good application, it's going to cost you. You know what I mean? It's going to cost you more than, you know, they, I mean, they have a budget of 1500 or $1,000 a year. You know what I mean? It's, it's going to cost you more than that, I would, I, would, I would say. So if you want to keep things simple, you just want to connect people. And like I said, like, I mean, Peanuts has up to 4,000 registered users. Not all of them are active. But I think, you know, I don't know, I just really like them. <laughs> and I, you know what I really liked about them the most? Because I'm from South Africa and I, I grew up and I didn't, I didn't recognize it at the time, but I, I, the area where I grew up, social capital was really kind of, you know, there was a lot of good, uh, sort of a high level of social capital. Everybody knew everybody. I mean, I kind of took that for granted. <laughs> now that I'm in Japan, <laughs> where the social capital is not as high, man, I used to love going to observe I used to love joining into the joining in with their um, you know their fest their festivities or with the activities because it was a very strong communal feeling, you know what I mean? And that's something that I don't know. It's something that's pretty invaluable. And if you can build that community for like thousand dollars a year for five hundred dollars a year, I think it's great. You know what I mean? But again, this this does have its place and it does have its limitations. So on the other hand, for example, Earth Day Money, their digital application was fantastic. Earth Day Money, their goal was to connect um, all the nonprofit organizations in Shibuya. So the way it was working with volunteers, vo you, you'd have these, um, oh, I think uh, Nishibe Sensei has raised his hand. Nishibe Sensei, please go ahead. Yeah, I thought uh, your talk is in the middle. So I, I didn't ask you, but uh, I want to add one comment uh, yes. regarding the Earth Day Money. Yes. You said the Earth Day money was uh, terminated, but uh, I just heard uh, the uh, Mr. Ikeda. Yes. In, uh, in succession. So the, oh, really? Yeah. So the Earth Day money is still alive. Oh, is, is he? Even is though, he... you know, uh, it seems to be that uh, it was ended, but uh, it's still alive. So you, you talked with uh, Mr. Saga? Yes, I spoke, I, 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 I spoke to Mr. Saga. I sent Mr. Ike, oh my God, I think I actually bothered Ikeda, Ikeda, Mr. Ikeda, Ikeda quite a bit. Now, uh, yeah, Ikeda uh, told me that he is in succession. So excellent, uh, I just excellent. wanted to say, you know, um, but even though it seems to be that there was a punctuation of the, you know, the community currency, it's still alive after some period of time, and then, you know, it's come back. <laughs> Nishibe Sensei, do you know if he's going to restart it digitally or with paper money? Uh, yeah, I think um, uh, they are now still planning, but uh, okay. I'm not really sure that they wanted to start a digital one or a paper one. But anyway, the paper money is still, um, you know, utilized. Yes, among yes. Yeah. So I mean, it, we, without uh, leadership, the, the money can be alive. That's that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yes, and I mean you're absolutely right because I I went to because it's so funny because during that period, say from like 2012, 2013 to maybe now, where Earth Day money was basically there was no leadership more or less. Like when I went to the Earth Day market, people were still accepting the currency, and it was, yeah, and, it was yeah. and it was still which I loved. You know, and I remember because I was really hoping that I could interview Mr. Ikeda because I only managed to speak to Mr. Saga because I emailed Mr. Ikeda many times, but I never got any response. But I'm, I'm really excited because I, because now the, the, the old website is down. But if you look at the old website, man, one of, the, one of the really nice things about their online application was that whenever somebody earned Earth Day money or they spent it, they could make a comment on the experience of using Earth Day money and they would show up on the website. So you had these thousands and thousands of comments of people that were using the currency. And at the same time, you could track how much currency, how much currency was issued every month and every year. And I think from that perspective, 
the, the digital application for as long as it did work. I, I, it was really attractive and I thought it was a great way to keep track of volunteering in Shibuya. But thank you very much for your comment, Nishibe Sensei. Okay. Anybody else? I I have a I have a, a, a question, just a clarification. Mm -hmm. um, you you had uh, discussed um, this you had this parallel in which you discussed the value of uh, of the currency in terms of the national currency, right? And uh, then you you also related that to to the number of uh, turnover that the community currency had, they would, I assume, would add up to that to that sum, right? So there's a notion throughout all that of the community currency being, uh, it, to some degree or other, uh, equated or eva uh, uh, equated to the national yen currency. And I wanted to know how people went about that because I assume that they had their own denomination whatever the peanut or the awa whatever and and uh, those units would be circulating and have some relationship to goods and services and then at some point there's a calculation to say that you know um, some kind of equivalence uh, uh, established uh, is, is that was that part of your uh, study of understanding that um, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm understanding 100%. Are you referring to this, this slide? Yeah, because here you have yen and then you have uh, the average redemption, uh, yes. currency issuance value. So there's an assumption there that these community currencies have some kind of um, uh, parity uh, to some kind of conversion from yes. the community currency to, to the yen. Yes. And how is that? I mean, is that is that a, a feature that they all do it the same way? Is it? Do you see what I mean? Is yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, is this things that they assume or calculate, or well, they have a method? Well, gen, gen, generally speaking, in terms of exchange, it's just kind of a one to one. Um, okay, so so in other words, all of these currencies assume that that one of their units is equal to a yen. Is yes. That it? Yes. That kind of, yes. Is that yes. is that is that a specification of these systems in all the cases, or or in some, or you see what I mean? To, to my mind, it's very diverse. Systems yes, yes, yes. To, to my to my mind, seem to be operating. Yeah. To my mind, all of them adopt that, and I think it's yeah. just due to simplicity. However, the one that I'll be discussing later, Omusubi currency, that founder, he's got a real ambition to create a completely independent local currency that will have its own exchange rate with the Japanese yen. But all the ones that I've encountered all circulate at a one-to-one -one, uh, with the Japanese yen. And I think it's just out of simplicity. And also the fact that, you know, none of these networks have enough, I mean, these are very small networks. So they, you know, in terms of the, the value of these networks economically, it's just, insignificant in comparison to Japanese yen. So if you were going to put any kind of exchange rate, I think it, it wouldn't work. Um, and so I think all of them just adopt one to one. I mean, so in other words, it's, uh, it's an arbitrary sort of uh, decision. Uh, it may help people in understanding how they would price things in the community. Yeah, currency. yeah. And I think, okay. it's almost, yeah, it's not even a decision. I would say it's just an assumption. That's just, I don't even think a lot of thought or consideration goes into it. People are just like, listen, it's one to one, and I think that saves a lot yeah. of explanations. Got, yeah, got it, got it. And then uh, the, the next point is the next point is is that all of these systems, they to their users, etc., they must have some kind of rationale. In other mm -hmm. words, they 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 would say, you know, we we set up the community industry to achieve this, right? Uh, is there is there a clear understanding of of uh, is, is there a common uh, message that all of them are trying? I mean, are, are there all systems trying to do the same thing their way? Uh, do they have a clear understanding of, of what they're doing? Uh, you know, what's the focus objective, if you will? Yes. Uh, great question. Great question. Um, so again, you know, I think a lot of, with a lot of these Japanese community currencies, the objective is kind of social. 
And I mean, all of them have, well, let me, let me just talk about specific examples. So for example, with Earth Day Money, what Earth Day Money wanted to do was, because these, the founders were very much involved with the nonprofit associations in Shibuya. And according to the co-founder, he said you had a phenomenon whereby um, you'd have the same volunteers would always volunteer at one NPO. So you'd have these separate communities of volunteers. And what they wanted to do was connect all these volunteer communities through the currency. So what they would do is they had 27 participating nonprofit organizations and they would have these organizations on their website. And it's for right. them, it's like they were trying to curate the volunteer experience in Shibuya. They were saying, yeah. listen, we've got all these volunteer organizations. Instead of just sticking to one, why don't you kind of shop for who you want? To... And it was very well organized because each activity was very much prescribed. So you'd click on a certain organization and you see on a Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, they've got a cleaning service or flower growing, or whatever. There'd be some specific activity that you sign up for you go do your volunteering, you earn the currency, and then you can spend it at one of the participating businesses. Um, and so they had a very clear goal of wanting to encourage volunteering in Shibuya. They wanted to encourage people to take part in volunteering. And they also wanted to kind of use the currency as a measurement tool for volunteering. And if you look at something like, let's say, almost to be currency, which all, well, let me just, let me go with Atom Currency because I'll discuss Omusubi Currency later. Atom Currency, they, they have different branches. So each branch kind of has different objectives. But again, the objective there, they, they want to encourage people to take part in civic activities, in volunteer activities. So you will take part in this activity. You'll see the big Atom Currency with the famous character. You'll take part in it and you'll earn your little, you'll, you'll do your volunteering and you'll earn a bit of Atom Currency and then you can use it Either, you know, you can spend the money, you can, you can give the money to someone else if they do a service for you, or you can spend it at, at the participating no, businesses. I, 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 okay, I, I understand, I understand uh, how it's used, mm -hmm. basically. I, I understand that it's a prop, so to speak, this, and I, it's like, uh, it's, a, it's something that, uh, it's almost like a badge uh, that people who are involved in a series of uh, volunteer, etc. Um, we'll have access to this currency and we'll use this currency that's like an, an identity, a social identity um, a thing. I can understand that, but my question was more pertinent to the actual use of the currency. In other words, in other words somebody, the proposition, the economic proposition to a use of the currency is these are the benefits of using a community currency and versus conventional currency uh, um, and 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 maybe you would add to that say well these benefits are more prominent or more immediately available in this array of social activities organizations that have that kind of common mindset but ultimately what i'm trying to say is that the technical definition of the money what the purpose of the money is what its function is mm -hmm. And why that function is different from conventional currencies. Got it. In other words, why would you want to use that? Yes, I mean, yes. you know, uh, right? Uh, apart from the, the, the other kind of, um, uh, I don't know how the term to use, but uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, group uh, identity thing. Yes, right? yes, uh, yes. So, uh, so, for, actual, so, for, so, yeah. so, for example, like if you're talking about a purpose, you're saying, for example, to improve local liquidity or to, to improve the, the multiplier factor locally or kind of a local protectionist? In, are you talking about those kinds of purposes? Yeah, and in, in, in other words, in other words, you know, one of the things you mentioned is that uh, uh, one of these many businesses, uh, uh, agglomer agglomeration of businesses around the currency uh, in a specific town of, uh, was it 5,000, uh, 500,000 people, there were 1,000 businesses, and those 1,000 businesses, none of them were Starbucks, right? So, yes, so yes. Right, there, right there, there's an advantage of, of trying to promote the, the economic activity uh, mm -hmm. or try to improve or to some, to some degree or other uh, support local uh, businesses, you know, against this onslaught of these big uh, uh, chains, et cetera, yes, that yes. sort of gobble yeah. everything up. Yeah, I think, I think unfortunately in terms of, you know, standing up against the big chains when it comes to these community currencies, that's, 
that's not always kind of a line they can draw in the sand, especially if you want participating businesses. Yeah. Sometimes you want as many businesses participating as possible. But again, that's, sure. what, that's what makes Omusubi currency so special because they do draw that line. But in terms of, I can think of two kind of specific purposes. The first thing mm -hmm. is to connect, to link the local businesses to these mm -hmm kind of local activities to kind of create a bridge, a link between that. And for the businesses, obviously, there's the benefit of being associated with helping to build the community. Secondly, in terms of just um, like we spoke about improving local liquidity or increasing the local multiplier, I think it's similar to increasing the local multiplier, but not in an economic sense, in a sense of increasing the amount of local interactions. If we use this currency, we can connect with each other much more. We can, we can. So, yeah. So the motivation of a business would be to say, okay, this is a kind of an advertising thing yes, for me. Absolutely. I get connected. To, I get connected to my user base, and 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 the currency in itself, which is the last poor question, was. I yes. mean, is it going to be used as sort of a discount coupon on a standard yen priced item? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So the, the, this the, the, this I I understand that. So it's uh, it's pretty much these Ukrainian currencies are pretty much driven by the overall global economics of the yen economy, and they respond or react to that and try to use these tools. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I'd like to have an opportunity at some point to discuss these issues from a different perspective, but I don't think here's the place right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyone interested, we can, we can discuss that. But thank you very much. This is very Man, interesting yeah, information. Th thank you for your very, very considered and, and very thoughtful questions. I mean, it even got my brain churning because I'm not normally thinking along that specific avenue. But I, I think when, yeah, when, when we get to discussing almost subi currency, I think you'll, you know, you'll, you'll find some interesting ideas there too. But thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, uh, Jeremy, uh, just one point. Yes. So thank you very much for, for this very interesting uh, presentation. That's just highly interesting. Um, thank you. With regard to these, um, how are they called? These little book, books uh, used to register credits and debits. We had them also in Germany and in France, uh -huh. but um, these were in exceptional cases. Uh -huh. And um, they existed in, let's say, systems in the tau shrinks or in the cell. Yes. But um, since the LEDs is based on the idea of double entry bookkeeping, people after a while became concerned and said, hey, how do credits and add a, a debits, how do they match? And um, I remember, or I know from one of the Tau shrinks, a bigger Tau shrink in Munich, they eventually gave it up and said, no, it doesn't match. The idea, which is very much associated with the um, let's type of systems is uh, that you have well, credits and debits, and they have to match at the end. Yes. And therefore, this uh, idea with having separate books uh, uh, remained a very marginal issue in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, the other point is uh, this let's type of tradition. Uh, well, I say let's type because uh, uh, they are all time systems by now. Sometimes yeah. this is confused because in yes. the past you said, okay, businesses are involved, but they are all basic, or almost all, they are time systems. There are very few exceptions. There's one, for instance, in Switzerland, which is not a time systems, but that's in one of the few exceptions. Mm -hmm. um, with double entry, then you also have the issue, uh, well, how about bad debts? Um, is that an issue with these systems that you say people uh, uh, leave the systems, they vanish, they are gone? You can't, Great question. You don't know where Great. They are. I mean, this, this is what I mean, and this is why I really wanted anyone that's got experience with these lit systems, because this is what I'm, I'm busy writing a paper at the moment. And I've gone through quite a lot of the Western kind of lit literature, and all of them point to, you know, they centralize, and there's these issues of bad debts, I believe. You know, there was one paper where, you know, one let system actually collapsed under the weight of these bad debts. And you don't see that at all in these four organizations. And my research partner said, he said, listen, yeah, these four organizations are great, but we need to think about what about other 
Are there other let systems like this in Japan that have failed? And we don't know the answer to that yet. However, for these four organizations, the bad debts are not an issue at all. And I'm trying to understand because, you know, you, you know you've got the, the, the issue of what do they call it? Uh, something number, <laughs> you know, when, when the population gets above 150 um, and, the amount, and, and the trust level kind of decreases, mm -hmm. there's a word, there's a it's something number. There was an anthropologist that came up with the idea that once you, once, once you get beyond like 150 people, the level of trust decreases, right? So that if, let's say, for example, you've got a let system with 400 or 500 people, the idea is that, well, now people are becoming stranger to each other the level of trust goes down and people might take advantage. But again, firstly, that has not happened with any of these organizations, which is quite impressive. But secondly, the one that I spoke about earlier, this one, Yorozuya, they actively encourage their members to go into debt. So they say to the members, listen, a negative balance is great. Why is it great? Because it means if you went into a, a negative balance, it means you brought out um, the talent or effort from someone else. And I had a theory as to why there were no bad debts or why this wasn't an issue. And this, um, I, I did some research into uh, Japanese cultural studies. And these two authors, Befu, which is a bit of an older paper, and more recently, Ohashi 2008, in their cultural investigations of Japanese social interactions, they found that there were very strong elements of reciprocity and obligation in Japanese society. Meaning that, and I've, I'm on an anecdotal level, I've experienced this in Japan, where if you do something for someone, they have to return the favor. They, they feel obligated to return the favor. Now, this is not purely a Japanese cultural phenomenon. People all over the world, you know, if you do something for me, I kind of owe you one. But I think the point that Befu and Ohashi make is that it's actually stronger in Japan and they've Furthermore, make the point that the importance of balance of social relations in Japan. So I kind of put forward, me and my research partner were talking, I put forward the idea that the reason why bad debts are not an issue in these four, because I mean, everybody's responsible for their own, you know, transactions. So if you wanted to have minus, 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 you could do that and no one would bat an island. And so I put forward the idea that due to the strong elements of reciprocity and obligation in Japanese society, Japanese actually maybe they feel bad about going into debt. And so that doesn't happen. Um, it's not a strong hypothesis. I'm still working on it and I still need to look into it more. But it's one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated with these, with these passport communities, because, you know, like I said, the one has got a thousand people and counting. The other one's got about 300 so yeah, it, it's, this is still something that, that I'm, you know, still processing and trying to find an answer to. Um, does, does, does that answer um, your question? Um, yeah, that's very interesting. In fact, in Europe, there's also not hardly any evidence. The only evidence we actually have about systems crashing because of that bad debts is uh, our two works, two studies by Mark Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, one of, of them in the, uh, was published in the IGCCR in 98. That's mm -hmm. about Australia. And yes. there's another st study uh, uh, from New Zealand. The point is not really that they collapse, but uh, I would say if people leave the system uh, and they leave their debts with the systems, mm -hmm. and if this happens quite frequently, uh, the activity in this system is fading away. And I, 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 would, I have no evidence for this, but my impression is that this is a problem of the European types of, uh, of uh, let's type of systems. People just join in and we know we have evidence. Now there's evidence, for instance, from empirical evidence from France, that there's uh, plenty of fluctuation in these systems. So some people try they leave the system after a while because they realize they can't really sell their esoteric trades. They don't have anything good to offer. Yeah. They try, they incur some debt and then they leave. But uh, this leads to a situation where activity gets lower and lower. Yeah. That's, uh, but that's hypothetical. I'm not sure about that. I, I think for me, what from, from actually going to these places, I did sense a very strong aspect of kind of bonding capital. 
Um, so you'd have people with very similar values. So for example, with our money, well, our money, it's, it's in a small town, I mean, way out of the way in Tokyo, it's very hard to access, but about 90%, almost all of their members are foreigners that move to the countryside for a certain kind of life. Um, and when I spoke to the organizer, he said trust was a big issue. I mean, their organization got started as a group of young mothers that wanted to support each other. And when I went there, I went there to the festival and they gave me a booklet and they gave me a certain amount of credit. But as soon as my credit ran out, they were not willing to let me go into minus, right? They were like, no, nope, that's all you get, buddy. You can't go into minus. And so that kind of told me like amongst them, there is this awareness that you know, these people, and these people meet monthly, they know each other really well. And so it's almost like a close group of friends, you know, you, you don't want to take, you don't want to take advantage of your friends and they're in a small town. So I don't imagine there are many people coming and going. If you may be in more of an urban setting, there might be more fluidity in terms of people coming and going, but it, there were certainly strong aspects of bonding capital. And certainly also with Mayu, Mayu like, you know, 70% of their members are over 60 years old. So it's a very particular community of people that share very particular values. Um, and so I think the aspects of bonding capital and everybody really knowing each other really well would uh, limit the amount of, you know, negative balances that do happen. But also with Mayu, we, we did kind of a group interview and a lot of them said, listen, some of us have been in this thing for 10 years and um, you guys might know this too. They've been, they've been part of this network for so long that after a while they just stop using the books and they just hang out together, which is kind of the point, which is kind of what you want with these organizations. You want people to move from a point of being strangers to building a community where they know each other uh, really, really well. Yeah, but that's, I mean, I'm, 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 I mean what you said just, just makes me even more interested in these systems. I think, I think going forward, these systems certainly have a role to play in Japanese society. I think in terms of development of social capital is an important um, aspect. It's an important kind of, it's something that Japan, Japanese society needs. And so the more of these systems that there are that can connect people, I think the better. If I could, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, uh, it, somebody else uh, I think no, it's uh, okay. mine, mine wanted to make a comment. Uh, uh, okay, I just briefly, uh, I wanted to speak to that point because I think it has to do, you know, um, our approach is very much uh, recognizing that money is an application. It's an information system. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a real world phenomena, right? Uh, yes. And um, it has a function, has a purpose. If that purpose is well spelled out to use it, you just will understand. So the question of this overwhelming debt uh, crashing the system, um, if, if money is viewed simply as a record of what happened, in other words, we have a system in which we have a means by which we measure value, and we commit to value within a community to provide value and to consume uh, value, then you know, the debt is not a real issue. And the debt has to be, by mathematically, has to be a mirror of positive accounts somewhere. So, mm -hmm. so the, the real issue is not whether the debt or people um, uh, don't, uh, uh, see, the real issue is that people do not reciprocate because they leave the system with a negative, that can be resolved very simply, and in our specifications of people currency, uh, we put clearly that uh, people can open, anybody can open and close an account, but uh, you can only close an account when it's at zero balance. So mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't leave the system, and you have, you have a, a contract with the community to, yeah. to reciprocate. So you can't really, you know, it's, that's an important thing. I don't, how many people would shy away from community currency if they saw that clause you know that would yeah. pretty that would pretty take care of this issue but i think <laughs> the, the, the the real issue the, the real issue the real issue is is um is the throughput you know in other words if the throughput's high and there's a lot of action going on then yeah. this debt is not an issue and yeah. uh, and and i i i think that 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 is a uh a, a, the final comment I wanted to make was the fact that in North America and all these lessons that I've seen for many, many years and I've watched, and as I see that the big problem is that the people who are committed, who start these things are people that are very particular individuals with a very common outlook in life, very critical with, you know, the way things are, and they're very idealistic. 
And yes. so they go into this idea of setting this thing up because they want to do something. But the problem is that the practical issue is that the, the vast majority of members, once they get to a certain size, are people that also have a life in the conventional economy. So as, as the pressures of the conventional economy goes up, then the, the, on them, and that's what's been happening for the last 40 years, is, is that uh, people have a tendency to not have much value to bring to these sort of marginal uh, idealistic uh, markets, right? And so it, it gets very depressed and you end up having this, this dynamic of very frustrated, motivated core of people trying to push the, the, the ideas or the ideals of this thing with yeah. a kind of lagging community. And I'm wondering, is that also something that's seen there? That is such a great point because in actual fact, like for example, Eurozia and our money, right? Not, sorry, not our money. Yeah, Eurozia and our money. My sense I got from those two communities, because I actually visited our money, my sense was that these people were actually relatively affluent. These were people that had lived in the city and made the choice to move uh, to a town because they wanted a certain kind of lifestyle. And I think that that idea of, you know, depression within the real economy kind of affecting the membership I think, oh, sorry, sorry, my son is crying for me. Sorry, my <laughs> give me a second, guys. I'm really sorry. Hi, darling, Angel. Just give me a second. Give me, I, I, I can't ignore my son. Just give me one minute. I'm really sorry. I'll get back to that point. Uh, if, if I may fill, may fill the pause, I think, Mark, you are quite right. This, what you said is really uh, universal. Yes, um, so I think for these systems, right. the second point was like Eurozia, right? That place, for example, that, that a lot of them, they, they have this kind of Waldorf school, uh, kind of very specialized education system. A lot of parents move to this town to send their kids to the school. These are not poor people. These are relatively affluent people. And I think they, they have managed to create an, F, an, an, an idealistic, um, you know, kind of uh, network. And I, I haven't been to Eurozia, so I really can't speak to it, but I, I think you, 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 you make a very, very valid point. Um, and that's, that's certainly something that I, I, will, I will look into. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's something that just kind of sparked off in my head. The fact that I don't think anybody in these networks is really, you know, struggling for money. And I think the, the minute you are struggling for money, I think that would put pressure um, on the network. And I think if they were able to deal with this well, you know, and, but, but I think that's maybe the strength of Eurosia where they don't really meet. These members don't meet. They just have this, this mailing list. And anybody, anybody needs secondhand clothes, you can get it with a currency. Anybody needs, you know, baby clothes or anybody needs old skis or whatever. It's almost just utilitarian in that way. But again, yeah. um, this is not a point that I've completely wrapped my head around, but I will certainly explore those ideas further with these organizations. Thank so, you. So just, just briefly, you just made a point that I think is important, is that there's a characteristic of the, a market, the market that, they, that, they, that they, they serve is a market of, for example, uh, moving, uh, Used stuff in between us is sharing a new stuff. It's sort of like a like a community uh, store or or um, like we have in Canada uh, where you you go leave your things and people for for administration fee can can access secondhand yes. stuff. Is that yes. really is that something? Yes, yes. That's that, that's that's, th that's an interesting point because that can really go pretty far. That can be very broad, and uh, uh, it's it's the way of getting the idea of community currency. To me, these community currencies are pointers to something. In my view, and the basis of my work and my study and my research is is very technical. But um, my view is that community currencies are the best way to do money, technically, scientifically, etc. Uh, but they're not necessarily the best way to deal with the problem of conventional money. Yeah. Because, uh, which is another, so getting people to use community currencies is a way of getting people to think about how to change 
uh, what we're doing in the bigger economy, which is, I think, the big danger. But anyway, I, thank I, you very much. Yeah, I just want to, I, I agree with you so much for me. Like, for example, I, I mentioned much earlier in the talk, I'm seeing so many of these kind of digital local currencies with applications being advertised on the iStore and so on and so forth. And for some of them, I'm not sure if they just glorified point systems. And I, I really want to pick up on your point. For me, I think it's very important for a community currency to introduce at least some level of paradigm shift in the way that you do view money. You know what I mean? So I, I agree with you on that point. Um, I think, um, Alaraj, you, you did raise your hand earlier. Um, did you, you still want to make a comment or a question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, super uh, seminar. Thank you. Uh, actu actually, I would like to talk about uh, the trust issue. Yes. As you told uh, us now about the uh, our money. Yes. I don't know if I pronounced it. You did. Correctly. Yes. Uh, I think that the uh, uh, the trust uh, issue is uh, a big issue in the community currency as a general. Yes. So in this uh, in this regard, I'm uh, uh, researching about uh, developing a new computational index mm -hmm. to enable uh, the members of any region to uh, uh, to know the trust index of the other member w within the same region. Yes. Uh, by using a neural network. Yes. So my question is. Uh, did you find any uh, uh, similar computational index, for, uh, computational trust index mm -hmm. in uh, those uh, community currencies uh, organization? No, I, I found nothing like that. The only thing, I mean, even close to that is, no, not, I mean, with only with Earth Day money, you, you know, your account showed how much you volunteered, how much you earned, how much you spent. But in terms of a, you know, computational sort of assessment of trust, I found nothing like that at all. So, so uh, the another question, how uh, uh, did those organizations uh, decide mm -hmm. about the uh, minus level of the uh, least currency? Oh, like the, to what the extent? Like what? What's yeah. the limit? What? What's yeah. the debt limit? What, what are the, the the most important parameter for their decision to uh, to the uh, minus level of the? I don't. I don't think. I don't think they have that. I don't think they have that kind of minus level. And I think it's kind of like I said. For example, when I went to our money, everybody's close. Everybody knows each other. And I think mm -hmm. if there is an upper debt level, I think people come to it organically. You know what I mean? It, it might be to the point where maybe me and you have exchanged for the past year, and then you're beginning to notice that, oh, Jeremy's actually, you know, he's, he's actually got a, a lot of minuses. And then I might notice that you notice, and then I might, you know, I might feel obligated to solve that. And this is something that in, I in, um, can't remember, the, I think it was Tichiji, Tichiji Sensei, I think he wrote, he wrote a, quite an in-depth analysis of Yorozuya, and he said with Yorozuya, like they encourage their members to go into negative balance. They say, go ahead, have as many minuses as you want. And in the book, he says, you think that if people have this freedom to have as many minuses as they want, you think that they would just, you know, take advantage. But he says, what instead happens is people get into minus and then they start to think about how can I make this up? How can I give back? And that is why I... I started theorizing this aspect of reciprocity and obligation in Japanese society is, I don't know to what extent, but I do think it is an, a, a, a determining factor in people not taking advantage of these systems. And I think, yeah, and I don't think anybody even, it didn't come up at all in any of the interviews, in any of my discussions with any of these people, because I think for a lot of these people, the issue is of the minuses and the plus, it's not so much a to have an accurate record of what's gone on, it's more just, it's a tool for connection and that's how they see it. Um, and so I think that's, that's sort of the, the attitude that people come to it with. Mm. And I, 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 yeah, mm. um, I think- I, I just wanted to say something to my end. Yeah, yeah. Don't. That might be interesting because we approach this from a, a systems engineering point of view. And uh, with regards to artificial intelligence, my background is uh, decidable ontologies 
in, in social systems and most specifically in the management of intellectual property. So the idea that you can code common language into a mathematical representation that later a computer can understand and make decisions, I think goes along with artificial intelligence and has something to do with this. But in our paper that I posted there, um, we have a section on pages five to seven where we discuss something that I think everyone should be aware of in terms of managing balances. And that is, I don't know if anyone's ever done this before. I've looked for it. I, I kind of like to think that maybe I, we're the first or I'm the first to do that. But uh, basically, there are only four permutations that you can have in a community currency of types of transactions. You have positive selling to negative, negative to positive. Then you have negative to negative and positive to positive. Uh -huh. And out of, these, out of these four permutations, there's only one. So, uh, sorry, uh, uh, in order to capture the idea of the health of the system, you have what's called the uh, system balance. And the system balance is simply the sum of all positive or the, the absolute value of all the positive or all the negative, which are mirrors, right? So it's the amount of value that's, been, that's, that's pending reciprocation, right? So, so you have that system balance and then you have everyone's individual balance. And it turns out that out of the, the, the four permutations, only one, only one increases the system risk, which is the, the, the system balance, mm -hmm. right? And that is when somebody who is positive sells to someone who's negative because if somebody who's positive, they sell to someone who's negative, that guy goes more negative and the guy goes more positive. So there's more, more uh, net amount. But if you manage the system and people are aware of this technique, then what you can do is you can say, okay, um, uh, all we have to do is when we see that somebody is very, very, very positive, because that's the problem. A few people end up being very, very positive. Mm. A lot of people mm. are negative, and that's when the yeah. system collapses, right? Yeah. So yeah. when that happens, what you do is that you, uh, in common interest, if everybody's aware of the system balance, the amount of stuff that's pending reciprocation, mm. and everybody can see everyone else's balance without discussing the types of transactions they do, that's private. Mm. If you have that, then you're able to manage in community that problem. And you make it a very clear, uh, uh, visible, uh, and quantitative problem. And so people can say, oh, we're having a problem with this it, too much positive or too much, too much stuff that's pending that we don't know is going to be reciprocated. Mm -hmm. So you can deal with that. And what you do is you encourage the people who are negative to, to trade amongst each other. Because no matter how much they trade, if they're negative, they're not going to increase the system balance. Yeah, uh, yeah. They're just going to move the negative balance of the system to one another. So I, I encourage people to look at uh, that discussion of that issue on pages five to seven of the paper I posted. But it's really, really crucial because it's not only applicable to the community currencies, and it's a great tool and a way of people to discuss this problem in a kind of objective way. Right? And so I just wanted to draw attention to that. Uh, thank you. I mean, thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, go ahead, Diana. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, was, I think some of this has been brought up in the chat as well. But we focused a lot on how you know, negative balances is what can make something go completely wrong. But uh, positive balances um, are just as much a cause of things going wrong. And in fact, more so, I would say, especially in in commercial mutual credit systems, you know, having spoken to the SADEX guys, I know that you know the brokerage work to try and get the companies with positive balances to spend that money uh, is one of the one of the, the blocks the system, and certainly that was one of the blocks we found in the Bristol Pound. And so, at the end of the day, the, you know, the real thing is not about how many debits and how many credits or what values they are. It is about having that marketplace and making sure that there, is, there are loops, um, you know, trading loops that are, that, are, that are able to be identified and, and built upon. And um, I, mean, I think where you've got a, a paper-based small system and it's largely focused on interpersonal connectivity, you know, that's fine because it can happen just by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for larger systems, trying to get that kind of marketplace and um, and understand those trading loops and build those is, is a much more difficult thing. I think the other thing I just wanted to pick up on is you were saying, you know, often it, it's, you, know, you gave the example, I forget which one it was now, that's based around a, a Steiner school, like the Kingauer, also yes. based around a Steiner school. 
um, and indeed a lot of you know a lot of local currency communities don't start from the poorest people with the least money they yeah. start from people who are thinking about uh, social dynamics you know complex problem you know a, a kind of woke feeling about you know how how community or, or the economy ought to be yeah and, and often it's very difficult then to spread local currencies beyond that kind of woke in group to yeah. you know to a much wider population and i and um you know that's really where i you know i'm trying to focus uh time and energy at the moment to just try and think about those dynamics so i don't know if, if you have um uh, what your thoughts are on that but th I also just wanted to say thank you very much this is, this is hugely interesting and I'm really enjoying it yeah I know th thank you for your comment I mean regarding those dynamics it's something that I it, it is something that I have you know wanted to spend more time focusing on because you're right it's absolutely essential you can't have a group of you know like we said <laughs> a woke group you know having a fun time and not really you know spreading that out but I mean like also what I just loved about going to particularly our money, they've also got a very specific kind of goal of what they're trying to do. They try, because in Japan, they've got this problem of ghost towns. Like, you know, urbanization has gone one way for too long and people, it's really important for people to start reinvesting in sort of the rural areas. And I think one thing that our money does really well is that the, the main organizers, they promote because they've got so many empty plots in this town. Like, and they say, listen, anybody wants to come back to the countryside, wants to reinvest in the countryside, we are an organization that encourages it. And in fact, I met one couple that had actually been living in Tokyo and they came to the same event I came to and they had been in touch with the community currency organizer. And so I think as a, as a way to facilitate people moving to the countryside, sort of reinvesting in the countryside, I do think that these Japanese pastoral communities have some there is some utility there, you know, and I think it, they, I think they could really be useful in that sense. But again, thank you for your comment. Does anyone want to add anything else? I'd, I'd actually really like to just talk about the the other community. Oh, yes, please. Yes, you've had your hand up for a while. Go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Federico. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you. No, I just have, um, I mean, I, I wrote some stuff on the chat yeah sorry uh, so, sorry had, for some, for some uh, reason I, before I, but no yeah i can't see the no chat problem it, it goes yeah. it goes in parallel and it's fine uh i i have to note that one of the things i found very telling into trying to introduce a discourse about uh, uh um, complementary currency and local economy exactly in this sense uh, to empower small communities and make them more resilient was to shift from uh, the idea of money as a as a sort of absolute uh, um, um, unit of measure into value flows mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. into recognizing and uh, uh, focusing and it's easier for people to focus on flows of value then trust becomes a value good air becomes a value space and cheap space becomes another value and you can start design with this so mm -hmm. i wanted just to point out that an interesting aspect uh practical very practical way in my experience that is mostly um southern uh, european uh, countries especially italy I, I live in holland but i worked a lot with italians and uh, I've seen what happened uh, with the similar uh, structure in Taiwan. I had the occasion to see that. So I can compare from this type of perspective. Value flows uh, uh, is a sort of key concept that can move from uh, uh, thinking in terms of quantity in, in terms of flows. Yeah, I, I just wanted to pose this uh, as yeah. an a observation. Thank you. I mean... I also think like that's clean. That's also something that I think, well, some of the, the community currency organizers that I spoke to, they don't articulate it quite as, as clearly as you do, but I do think that their mindset is kind of focused or bent in that way, you know, as opposed to thinking of money as sort of this absolute value and, and thinking more in terms of yeah, these, these value flows. Uh, I'm going to post maybe in the chat for for others uh, more technically minded uh, a link to value flows in terms of ontologies uh, for um, uh, RIA 
for accounting, it's not exactly what I mean. I, I mean mostly to use that type of vocabulary in the narrative that you want to inf insert from you know an innovation political side into a place. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing that I found very interesting, first of all, okay, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. My pleasure is that uh, uh, we rarely map in the terms of value, but I think it's very important, the amount of economic education that you do by inserting in the right way into a community, um, a local currency, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. actually comes back, fires back, and uh, was not a, a case that was in the Steiner School, uh, in your, one of your examples that was mentioned, Steiner School. Yeah. And, um, the motion of people as well as key factors i would say but also key values that are inserted into a territory because awareness of economic laws becomes a, a way to design with these economic laws for mm -hmm. your own interest locally and so that's that's a plus i think very interesting it should be discussed more maybe investigated more thank you very much thank you very much for your comment um, does anyone else have anything to say? Um, if not, I'm just going to go ahead. There's just one more just, organization. Just one thing. I, I, yes, I, I, go ahead, go ahead. I, 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 I have to go. So okay. I, I, I'm running out of time. I'm, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me and thank you for your presentation. It's nice to know that there are other people in the world that are thinking about these issues. And it's, uh, it's, you know what? You know what? It's I nice. For, it's nice. Yeah. Now, I, just, I just want to say it's nice for me to give a presentation where I don't have to spend the first 20 minutes explaining what a community currency is, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> okay, uh, one of the things that I wanted to, it's this, I was at the other, at the last um, uh, um, Ramix uh, presentation. This is the second one. And um, is there any, anywhere where we can leave our contact information or uh, is this some kind of administration, these meetings or something or? Because everybody's got their Zoom ID here, but I. Uh, oh, were, were I you mean, were, were you part of the mailing list? Yeah. yeah well, I, actually, I Mark, need your paper, yeah. Mark. Yeah. Mark. Huh? No, can I clarify what's happening? I need here? your paper. Yes, it, it's. I put the link to the paper at the beginning of the chat. You can find ah, that. Ah, okay, thank you. Okay, but what clarify? are they? Yeah. Mark, can I clarify for everybody what happened here? Yes. Yeah. Um, when we had the conference in Japan. I suggested that we ought to have regular meetings in between of groups of people around different subjects so that they could then present at the next conference and we will know each other rather than turning it around after two years and maybe not knowing people. Um, and then a little bit later, it was proposed to do a round table and three of us were invited to um, take part in that round table. I was one of them. At that round table, Diana offered to do a presentation. So I, Mailed a whole bunch. I said, that's great. I would love to have that. And I mailed a whole bunch of people um, and said, hey, come along to this. It's great. You don't have to be in Ramex. Um, find out about Bristol Pay. And a load of people came last time and that was successful. And I said, well, we ought to formalize this a little bit more and decide what we call it and try and do it as a Ramex thing and properly advertise it. Um, and I asked Jeremy if he would be willing to present. And he said, yes. Um, somebody who's not here, Chris, um, has suggested we should call it Ramix Conversations. And I like the idea of once a month, somebody presenting who is either a practitioner or a theorist. It doesn't matter, it can be a mix of them. And that we have like this an extended chance to really interact with them and find out about their um, research. So as of now, there's no formal mailing list. It was friends of Marcus, if you like. I invited uh, a bunch of people I thought would be uh, relevant okay, to oh, it. Oh, okay, um, but I, we can I, I, make I, that, we can make a mailing list. No, I got I, I got I got involved in Ramex through MRC, the the from Sofia Bulgaria and uh, Rosita Toncheva that uh, put me in contact. With, I assume that you're in contact with her. Anyhow, uh, uh, just feel free uh, to share my email to anybody who's interested, Marcus. Uh, okay, I'll do and, that. And and if there's any possibility of getting at least uh, a way to contact the different people, because everyone has made comments and and you know we may have questions that we want to direct a person after. The meeting. So if that's possible, 
just I assume that it's 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 your it's your uh, your uh, task, right? So, Marcus, I, I trust you perfectly on that, and I look forward to further communications. And thank you very much for this, and I look forward to participating and hopefully being able to present our work too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. All the best. Take care. Bye bye. Cheers. You want to carry on, Jeremy, and do the rest of the presentation? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not much left. There's just one more organization that I want to discuss. Okay, so this is kind of the last one I want to discuss, and this is called Omusubi Currency, or Omusubi Tsuka, Tsuka meaning currency in Japanese. This is just an organization that I was quite um, impressed by. Um, they started in 2010. It's a paper currency, but at last count, they had more than 800 uh, participating stores and based on what he told me in the interview these are all like there's no Starbucks there's no convenience stores these are all kind of locally based businesses in 2019 they issued about seventy thousand dollars worth of currency and the founder is Dai Yoshida and um, so I just want to talk a little bit about them um, and so if you rem if you recall from earlier when we spoke about the HR and funding requirements as you can see, Omusubi currency, they have a yearly budget of $350,000, um, but they are the only organization here that has a big budget or big or relatively big budget. And 100% of that budget is for running a community currency. Like with Hirari and Sarari, they've got their nonprofit organization that, you know, they do these other services and the complementary and the, the community currency is supplementary. With Omusubi currency, it's all community currency. And it's, it's really impressive that they are financially independent. Budget of $350,000. And they are no longer reliant on subsidies or anything. They've created a business model that actually works really well. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. So for those of you who don't read Japanese, it says, Minna Detsukuru, a made by everyone, Kodomo. Yume no Shotengai, Kids Dream Shopping Street. Now, when I encountered Omusubi Currency about five years ago, when I first locked onto their website in 2015, it was covered by a lot of, there was a lot of ideology. There was a lot of, you know, in Japan, you know, the, the rate of entre entrepreneurship is so low and we need to connect with our local businesses, locally made, locally owned. There was a lot of that. Right, and this um, kids' dream market was just a small part of their activities. And then, what happened over the years, the kids' dream market aspect became bigger and bigger and bigger. And now, the entire currency is centered around these kids' uh, dream markets. So, the way it works is that, you know, about well, be before the pandemic, they would have it about three times a month. You'd go to an elementary school, you'd say, Listen, We've got this market for kids. The kids can make what they want. They can sell their own cookies. They can sell the old toys. But it's a market where kids can, you know, practice basic skills in commerce and salesmanship. So the kids come to this market and they make their own things. They make their own little brooches and they sell these to anybody that comes to the market. Now, in order to support these kids, you have to exchange Japanese yen for Omusubi currency. Once you have the Omusubi currency, you can, you know, support these kids and these kids basically make money or they, they, they earn this kind of um, community currency as payment for doing their goods and services. And then outside of these regular kids markets, you can spend this currency at around um, 800 at this point, 1,000 businesses. Now, what I love about this currency and what I love about the way it's being introduced, an obstacle that I'm sure some of you maybe encounter when you discuss community currency with people, it's like, oh, that's kind of like monopoly money. You know, it's kind of like Mickey Mouse money. Nobody takes it seriously. And that's a bit of a negative, right? But and I don't know if he did this consciously, but what he's done is he said, listen, this currency is essentially just to support these kids' economic education. So come on down, you can exchange it, uh, for, you can bring it, you can exchange your Japanese yen for this currency 
and you can support these kids. And it's kind of nice, you know, these are elementary school children, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. So maybe you don't want them working with real money. So it's kind of this kind of play setting. But in the meantime, he's managed to sign on more than 800 businesses that accept this currency. And so the way it stands at the moment is, this is kind of how it works. From 2010 to 2016, he was, they were reliant on grants and subsidies to kind of you know, pay their employees and to run the organization. But from 2016, the kids' dream market really took off. Now, the way the kids' dream market works is they go to big companies, they go to malls, sometimes local government, and these companies, they pay um, Omusubi currency. They pay them for the opportunity to host this market. So maybe the local mall, because you know the, the, the event, these kids' dream market, they've become quite popular. They've got a little bit of television coverage, a lot of newspaper coverage. So it brings in customers to the mall. So people pay Omusubi currency for the opportunity to host this kids market and that's their revenue and that's how they are able to have a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar budget and pay for all their employees and then the kids dream market is how the currency enters into circulation and then from the kids dream market you can spend it at any of these um participating you know participating local stores and only the businesses can exchange it for japanese yen they also so they, they have a six month deadline. So you have to spend the currency within six months for various legal reasons. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but if you can't find a place to spend the currency, they have a catalog of locally produced foods like um, miso, rice. These are, lo these are uh, products produced by local producers and you can, you can use the Omusubi currency to buy these local products. And then these local producers can change it to Japanese yen. So one side effect of this currency is that it has started funneling Japanese yen to local producers, to, to local businesses. And so I'm just really impressed that they, they are actually accomplishing two really good goals. Number one, they really succeeding in the economic education of young people. And number two, they are funneling at this point, a very low amount, of Japanese yen and in that way supporting um, local businesses. Um, furthermore, this founder, he's got Yoshida Dai, he's got really big plans for Umusubi currency. He's hoping to create a completely independent currency whose value is based on a basket of goods. I'm not sure how he's gonna do that. Um, but I just like the way that he's taken the Mickey Mouse element and used it as a way to kind of, you know, introduce community currency. It's kind of like a Trojan horse way of introducing community currency. So yeah, that's all I had to say about that. If anybody's got any comments or anything like that, please go ahead. Can I say something? Yes. Thank you very much for your nice talk on My the pleasure. Japanese uh, community currencies. I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, I guess you didn't uh, mention about uh, uh, another, uh, you know, current of the local currency in Japan since nine, 2001, or maybe two, 20 years ago. There used to be a lot of uh, 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 eco money yes. in, in 2000. So eco money is something like uh, uh, time banks in UK or uh, the time uh, dollars in the United States. So there were more than hundred of uh, eco monies used to be, but uh, all other gone. They didn't survive. So I thought, you know, uh, we have uh, lots of uh, paper monies and uh, red systems here in Japan, but uh, in the UK and the US. Um, there are many time banks and then, you know, the time dollars. So, uh, you know, uh, reflecting on the fact, I suppose there are very contrast uh, between the Japan and the US and the UK. Yeah. 
uh, related to the, the fact let's is very popular and the, the, they survive in Japan. Yeah. I think the Japanese people are fit uh, the sense of commons uh, based on the, the let systems. I think. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, in Japan, there is no, not so much, uh, you know, philanthropy type of uh, spirits, you know, volunteer type. Yes. So yes. it's always a reciprocal yes. change in the communities. So that's why, you know, I suppose there is a big reason for, um, you know, uh, because uh, the lead system is still uh, alive. And then, and I, I wanted to say one thing, and uh, the, the concept of, uh, you know, the debit and the credit in the lead system is different from the debit and the credit in the, you know, the market economy, the yeah. conventional market economy. Uh, in, when we borrow the money from the banks, uh, it's a, you know, uh, individual relationship between you and, uh, you know, banks. So I, I can say it's a I owe you. Yeah. But uh, in the lead system, is it's different. Uh, even though I, you know, uh, take some services from other members, you know, it, it's not an IOU. Yeah. I say it's an IO communities. Yes. Community, which is a collection of the members. So it's a kind of a collective relationship between the individuals and the community. So yeah. uh, I think the sense of community is in Japan is very strong. That's why I think, you know, uh, you know there is a, a contrast relationship. Yeah. In I, I, US countries. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that, that it's certainly an aspect of Japanese culture that has influenced um, the success of those let's um, passbook communities. So yeah, I think we are in absolute agreement there. Thank you very much, Nishibe Sensei. Okay. And uh, I, I want to add another thing uh, I have here. Uh, can you see the Atom Tsuka? Yes, Atom. yes. Actually, uh, this paper currency is based on the uh, manga characters. Yep. Uh, very famous, uh, known as uh, Astro Boy. Yeah. Yeah, Astro In, Boy. Uh, that's it. Yes. Astro Boy is here. That's why this is very popular. Uh, written by uh, Osamu Tezuka. Tezuka Osamu? Yes. And uh, yeah, the Tezuka production uh, for the animation is based on the Waseda shopping street. Yep. That's why the base of the, you know, the atom uh, currency is in, uh, you know, Waseda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's an interesting uh, thing with, with the Astro Boy, because in the comic book, I think as, the Astro Boy comic was started like in the 1950s or 1960s. And uh, in the comic books, he's, he is born in the year 2001, which back then was way in the future. And atom currency was launched on his birthday Yes. Kind of in 2001, yeah. It's really interesting. This is a ten baliki paper money. The baliki means horse powers. Yes. The horse Astro power. Boy is uh, you know, driven by the horse powers. <laughs> Actually, the atom atomic powers, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of story is shared by all the people uh, who use these currencies. Yeah. I mean, especially if you go to Waseda, to the to the Atom Currency head office, like that station there, and also in Ni Niza station, which is just outside of Tokyo. Like the wall is painted full of that Atom Currency, the characters, the music is playing. And so it's very much connected to that um, local area as well. It's really special. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nishibe Sensei. Go and ahead, Dan. Here, I, just... I okay. Go. Oh, sorry, Nishibe Sensei. Yes, Diana. Okay, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, sorry, I just wanted to, to I mean, it, it's amazing, um, what uh, what Omosugi currency have done. I mean, that's yeah. just stunning, and I love, I love the fact that it is both educational and it is uh, driving footfall to local shops. I mean, it seems to me incredible that they can be raising. Three hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year from hosting kids markets. I mean, can you give us a sense of how many 
you know, is it, is it six markets a week? Or it, it, it's, three, it's, three, it's three a year, uh, three a month before the pandemic it was about three mm -hmm. a month. Um, he said normally about, there'd be about $2,000 worth of um, Omusubi currency would be issued at each event. Um, but he didn't go into the, uh, and I, 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 I wasn't, maybe, maybe, I should, maybe I should be more um, forceful when I interview people, but I didn't want to ask him how much they pay for each event. But what I, I have paid attention to the media, uh, to the media depiction of, so the way the media depicts Omusubi currency, they don't mention the currency at all. It's all about the market. Nobody even mentioned that there's a community currency here. Um, and I think from speaking to the co-founder, he said in the first few years, he used to be very vocal about community currencies and about the reasons why they are important. And he found that the more he kept quiet about speaking about community currencies and he actually just created something that was of value to the local community, he was able to kind of introduce his values in a kind of sneaky way. And, but I, I think it's just the case. He said for him, his opinion on a lot of community currencies in Japan is that they don't have a real purpose. They don't have a real, not even a stated purpose. They don't, they don't fulfill a very, so for him, the very specific purpose that Omusubi currency fulfills is, listen, you want to support these kids, get the currency. It's like, if you go to a carnival, right? If you want to ride on the roller coaster, buy a ticket. And for him, it's that mundane and it's that simple. And he says but, that's the... But, yeah? Presumably, though, when people are buying that currency, he has to put that money into a backing account so that when the yes. traders... Yes. Uh, you know, so, so that's not a way of making money, just selling the money. Um, no, no, no. no, no he, 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 makes, he makes the money. So, for example, let's say there's, there's a local shopping mall that wants to host the market. Yeah. They pay him money. Him to host the market. So they must be paying a, a lot. I'll do the math, but that, that's a lot per, you know, if it's three markets a month, yeah. that's a lot yeah. of money per market. Okay, thank let, you. Yeah, let me just think about that because actually, so let's say if you've got uh, three markets a month, three times 12, 36, 350 divided by, oh, I lost my It's kind of 10,000, 10,000 per, per market roughly, which seems, yeah, it seems high. I'm not sure that would work over here, uh, especially. Yeah, that's about, that's, think, about ten, uh, that's about 10, 10, $9,700 um, yeah. for each market. Um, so like the, I only have his word to go on it. And as well, I, I've been meaning to actually go to one of these markets myself to see, because I've only, I've only seen video footage and I've only seen like what they put up on, on the website, but I've changed job twice in the last eight months. But one thing I really want to go down to, it's in Toyota city. And I really want to see it for myself and actually speak to these shopkeepers for myself. Um, but yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I hadn't even thought about that, but $10,000 to host a market. Well, it depends then how, how much business is the market actually bringing in. For, course, for me, I would be curious then how many kids are attending the market and how many customers is it attracting in a day. And then I think we might get a better sense of the economics involved in that. But yeah, great comment, Diana. Um, but for me, the exciting thing about Omusubi Currency, it's just one of those organizations that I want to know more about. Because if it is working as well as he says it is working, and I've, I've got no reason to think otherwise, I think there's, there's something to kind of learn there. Thank you, that's great. Oh, yes, go ahead, um, mine. Sorry, I didn't see your hand raised there. Yes. Thank you. Just I want to mention about a new uh, extra comments about Diana uh, comments. Uh, similar idea to uh, Mosubi, Mosubi currency is yes. uh, Kizania. Mm -hmm. Have you gone there? Kizania? Kizania in Tokyo, yes. It's an uh, entertainment place in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. This place give uh, Kizania currency to the children who uh, come to this entertainment place and teach uh, the children uh, different professions, like to be a dentist, yeah. a doctor, any profession, many professions there. And regarding their job, 
they take money, Kizania currency, from uh, a bank account, Kizania uh, bank account, yeah. took the currency, and then they can buy uh, anything from Kizania place, uh -huh. like restaurant or a mall, Kizania mall. Uh -huh. Uh, and they can buy anything from the Kizania uh, entertainment. So I think this such ideas about uh, Kizania currency yes. uh, is a very uh, attractive idea to teach children how to use money and how to earn money. This is yes. the most important thing, so, I think. So, 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 so let me get this straight. So there's this place where these kids can learn different skills. So let's say, for example, I'm the one teaching the kids the skill, do I get the currency or do the kids get the currency? No, kids uh, get the currency. So they get their job, like a baker, ah. baking, or, or, or working in the gadget. It's a job business. training. Yes, job training. Theme park. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, wow. It's in a place, yeah. Very, very, it's very famous, uh, you know, private uh, theme park. In yeah, I, I took my children there and I. Uh, <laughs> Surprised about their idea. Very, very interesting. Yeah. The Kizania is it written in English or in Katakana? No, it's in alphabet English. Okay, Kizania. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's very famous. I'll, I'll look it up. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, Thank Mr. You. Yoshida got the uh, hint and the idea from the Kizania. Uh, I suppose. Oh. Yes. Oh, yeah, because I know he, oh, that's interesting. This that's is an application of that kind of idea to the local currency. Community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Kizani is an international uh, entertainment place, not just in Japan. So, yeah, very good is idea, it, I think. Is it international? As yeah. I think, yeah. I, 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 I noticed. Yes, I just posted China. a link in the chat. Okay. It's like a Disney run, right? Yes, yes, yeah, but very interesting idea. I would, I would love to go. I mean, how, how, I mean, I mean, this is kind of not on topic, but how old can you? How, what, what's the, what's the, well, from what age can you take your kid? Because I want to take mine. Actually, I, I didn't remember because before Corona, I went there with my children. So I think, and, and yeah, uh, up to twelve years old, I think okay. yeah, they can enter there. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'll, def I'll definitely check that out. I think, because I've also seen a couple of, I mean, um, this one, where's a Toda also have like about, I think it's two or three times a year. They also have a very similar kids market where the kids do something and they can earn the currency. Um, it's normally a good, I mean, it's, it's people always, you know, would support that kind of initiative and it's a good way to get a purpose for the currency and also to draw interest. So, yeah. Do you know, it's also kind of advertising for the companies, for example, Toyota, come to this place and teach children about their products. Hmm. And they, the children earn the money regarding their job in Toyota, in wow. Kizani place. And the children take their salary <laughs> from <laughs> the bank within Kizania, and then they use their money to buy like uh, anything they want yeah. from Kizania place, restaurant or mall. And after that, the family plus the children, after getting out from the Kizani place, all of us are happy. Yeah, yeah it's nice experience to go there. Yeah, Great actually, stuff. they Great are funded stuff. by the Toyota Foundation. Ah, really? Yes. That's interesting. Uh, and also, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, very innovative idea. Because, because, yeah, because I think I, I mean, this is also just coming back to the the revenue stream of. Or Musubi currency because I mean I was just on the website again the other day and they still have certain I think that I think it's also the Toyota Foundation yeah. I'm not sure if they still I'm because I saw it on their website because one of the foundations went away and it came back recently so maybe that's also part of their revenue stream and that might also explain the three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year but what Yoshida son did tell me was that they they don't rely on the um, on the um, sort of uh, grants anymore, but mm -hmm. I'm, to, to what extent that is true, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but yeah, interesting. Do, do you know about Yukoreto, Yogaret? Yukoreto, it's a famous, a famous company in Japan. 
No. Also, they, they, they went there and uh, kind of advertising and they teach the children about the benefit of this yogurt. Yogurt. Yes, yogurt. And then uh, they take the salary to buy such kind of a products. Like also kind of marketing. Okay. Okay. So it's yes. So, so, right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. Takada-san, I invited one Japanese uh, yes. researchers on the Japanese community currencies. Takada-san, yes. <laughs> do you have any questions? Uh, thank you. you just wrote the paper. Uh, mm, thank you for uh, degrees. Uh -huh. Thank you for uh, Jamie. Thank you this uh, um, uh, talk and the presentation. Good presentation and thank you. Thank you. Uh, interesting uh, talk uh, and the meeting and I'm so happy to join this meeting, Zoom meeting. I I'm very happy. And uh, my mm, one question, only one question, one phrase. My uh, 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 Osaka City University's uh, examination um, um, is uh, uh, a study of viability uh, of local currencies mm -hmm. um, between um, based on case of ex existing uh, com uh, local currency and abolitions uh, cur uh, cur currencies difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think um, it is uh, one phrase is uh, value co-creation, value co-creation. Mm -hmm. uh, last, uh, last September, um, I visit to uh, Sarabet's village in Hokkaido. Yes, um, yes, Sarari, 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 yeah, Sarari right? Yeah. I interviewed to uh, Mr. Oikawa. Yes. Interview, you know, Oikawa. Yes. And he said, uh, the Sarabet's village uh, is uh, uh, decreasing uh, people, decreasing people. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, out of taxi, taxi is stopped. So all the people cannot to cannot go to hospital. Yep, yep. So, so uh, sad. Old people. Um, yes. For example, um, the uh, one uh, women woman said that uh, I cannot go to hospital because I cannot cannot drive my car. Yes. Drive cab. Yeah. So. Um, um, Sarabet's uh, uh, salary, salary, uh, salary people uh, help to her, and uh, she is she is waiting uh, on entrance uh, for helping people. Yeah, she's and, in the waiting uh, list. Yeah, and, uh -huh. and go to uh, on the way to. Uh, the hospital uh, on the way and and uh, back to uh, the home one day and next yeah. day next day um, uh, he, he helping helping uh, person said to her uh, if you need uh, I can buy your uh, dinner on the okay. shop uh, she said Please, please, uh, please help me the dinner. So, um, 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 increasing uh, uh, values day to day. Yeah. So, um, community uh, local currency and, uh, 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 maintain is uh, increasing uh, the value. If you if we increasing the value, local currency is uh, maintained. 
if uh, not to, not to, uh, increasing the value, uh, not maintain. I think. Yeah. What, what do you think? So you just uh, value, yeah, value, co value co creations. So what do I what do I think about like in, in general about value co creation and value community? Co yeah, that that right. I mean, I think in term obviously, you know there's a certain amount of value in the community and you can almost say like potential value. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a lot of us maybe know this and, and community currency is one way to kind of bring out um, that potential value. But especially when you are talking about, I mean, this is, this is maybe not so much the Sarari model, but more the, the um, passbook model where, you know, there's no real limit on the amount of value that there is as long as people are taking part in it. So I think it's certainly, it's a very important aspect of it. But I think that the challenge for Sarari, I think is like you said, it's kind of de a decreasing population. I think the town has a population of about 3,300 people, right? Uh -huh. And I remember when I interviewed Oikawa-san and he said that is kind of one of their challenges that they are trying to face. And they also had an issue where, um, because they've got a certain number, the, the way I understand Sarari is there are people that give the service and there are people that are waiting to receive the service. And there's a bit of an imbalance in mm -hmm. between the two. And that was actually something I was thinking about because Sarari is actually a really well implemented community currency. And I think Nishibe Sensei, you were a consult, a co you, you were part yeah. of the, the process to starting it. Yeah. To, to, those, to those of you who are not familiar with Sarari, one of the really good things of Sarari was like early in the 2000s when the community currency boom happened, um, obviously community currencies were well known throughout Japan and many municipalities that had experimental phases where they sponsored um, a community currency project for a year or two. Many of these projects fell away. Sarari was one of those projects that continued. And I think one of the reasons they did was because they were very smart in realizing that in the long term, you need, you need some kind of revenue stream. And they established a nonprofit organization, which, you know, uh, they, they provide certain services to the local town and the community currency kind of um, is, is, is a kind of a subsection of that. But because as long as this NPO continues functioning, the, non, the, um, the community currency will continue to function as well. And regarding value co-creation, sometimes, sometimes it's a bit of a challenge, you know, like with Sarari, when you have limited human resources. As far as that goes, I think that's also one of the reasons why you need to have some kind of a structure where even if there's kind of a, a period of low resources, human resources or otherwise, that the community currency can continue just surviving until you get to a point where maybe you can change that balance because you, you're not always going to be able to create that value. And what happens with a lot of community currencies that don't have some kind of a long-term management framework in place, if they go through a dry period with this little value being created, they can die away. But if you have a good framework in place like Sarari, you know, that framework allows you to keep surviving until you can find a way to recreate that value. Does, does that make sense, Takata-san? Uh -huh. Yeah, so I mean, that, that, that's my feeling regarding sort of value co-creation and particularly with, with the Sarari case. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. I, I advise the people of Salali to be economically independent of a uh, government subsidy. Yes. Because yes. if you get a government subsidy, uh, you can take three or five years to be continued uh, yeah. for the business, but after that, it cannot. So, you, so I advise them to be economically independent uh, by establishing a nonprofit organization and which has some kind of uh, social businesses yes. other than just, uh, you know, local currency business. Yeah. That's one thing. And another thing is uh, they have a very good relationship with the 
uh, municipal government because the, the OB, uh, Oikelsen is come from the uh, Chamber of uh, Commerce. Chamber of Commerce and the other members uh, come from the you know uh, local governments of uh, you know uh, the retired retired. So uh, they have a very good relationship and uh, as far as I know, the salary is the first uh, community currency uh, by which uh, they can pay the local taxes. Yeah, they can pay taxes and I think they can so, also pay like water and electricity and some of the utilities. Um, Oikawa san told Utility. Yeah. yeah, like water, electricity, gas. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, gas for the car, right? Yeah. So, yeah. As far as I know, you know, we can live on uh, in a salary uh, village if you get, uh, you know, uh, the sal of its currency, salary yeah. currencies. So that's very independent, I think. Nishibe Sensei, what was really interesting about your recommendation to them to have an independent, you know, um, you know, nonprofit is that Hirari, this number yeah. seven over here, Hirari, they had a similar a situation where after their experimental period, it was also recommended to, to have a nonprofit organization as a basis, a, a revenue a receiving nonprofit organization. They were a little bit slower to implement it, but I think eventually they did. So, and that was like a completely independent, like research organization gave that a recommendation. So, yeah. Yeah. We describe all, all the things in the, the book, uh, Community Doc. I read it. <laughs> I read currency. the book. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, the book was so useful to me because before I interviewed yeah. Oikawa, because I interviewed Oikawa-san and he was telling me a lot of information and then, in bit, and then I interviewed him a second time. And in between the first and the second interview, because your book was published fairly recently. And then, yeah. I mean, the book had such use. I think for me, like, I mean, I really think that kind of model, that kind of that revenue producing non nonprofit model. And I think generally in Japan, there is, there is kind of a trend for local municipalities to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Outsource certain services to nonprofit organizations. And so that kind of really fitted in with the kind of, with that trend as well, which is why I think it was so effective, you know? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Takada wanted to ask you that, that uh, you know, sharing the value between the, the people in the village, not only the members, but also other uh, non-members have uh, some um, uh, shared values in uh, the commons ah. of the Ladi village. That's a very core, of, core concept of the uh, Salari because it is called the uh, Koekitsuka, public yeah, ko interest. Yeah. Uh, money, right? <laughs> yeah, pu public, public interest money, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I think I think I, misund I misunderstood that a little bit. Um, yeah. in, in my interview with Oikawa-san, I think I wasn't, I, I didn't ask him too much about the interactions between the users that much. I was much more kind of focused on the overall uh, management of the currency, but I'm I'm really I mean it's I'm I'm really happy to hear that there are those kinds of really good interactions between the actual members because in the current it shows that the currency is actually doing its job, you know, which is good. Okay, uh, yeah, I put the post a link yes to the book. Okay. Okay. But it's, in, it's written in Japanese. <laughs> yeah. Listen, if <laughs> anybody, seriously, Japanese. if anybody wants, because what, what the way, because normally for me, it's very difficult when I read Japanese, it's very difficult for me to retain the knowledge. So I normally have little mini translations that I write in the margin. Because uh -huh. normally when I, come, when I come back to the book, it's just such a big bother to read the Japanese all over again. So I normally... Anytime I read anything in Japanese, I translate it paragraph by paragraph. So if anybody would like my really, um, my, my, my so-so translation, um, please send me an email. I'll be happy. Partic that, that's the chapter on, um, on uh, sorry, on, Sara on the Sarari currency. I'd be happy to send you my, my not so good translation. I don't know. <laughs> it's a lo long link. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um. To the Amazon, but uh, the Amazon Japan, so it's uh, the Japanese books. 
No, no, I just need a lecture. Be quiet. What did you say, Marcus? It works. Thank you very much. The link. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, uh, that's great. If you could say, save it. And um, uh, Nishibi Sensei, I don't know if you have an English version or you plan an English version, but if you have an electronic copy, um, I know it's not perfect, but a very rough translation through a machine translator can help us that don't speak good Japanese to, I, I, to get I, an idea. I, I recommend to those who do translation. Yeah. Recently, I've started using Deeple, which I think is a better application than... I can hear the PDF of the book. So, uh, how can it... I put it here, maybe. <laughs> no, I, I don't put it here. Send it later when we sort yeah. out a mailing list and then people can ask you for it. Because there might be a copyright issue if you just send it to everybody. Okay. But I'm not sure. Um, are we about coming to the end now? We've, we've talked for quite a time. Yeah, we have, eh? Hey? Um, yes, yes. And we've, we've gone down to seven participants from sort of 15. So I think <laughs> we've, we've lost half the people. So thank you very much, Jeremy. That was really great. Ach, Marcus, thank you for the invitation, man. Uh, it's just so nice for me. I was, I was saying the other day because my only real interaction with other I mean, aside from the Japanese researchers that I've been in contact with, but the only other contact I've had was at the conference, which was two years ago. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to future um, more conversations like this, and I'll, I'll definitely take part if I can. It's just great to, to meet and, and exchange ideas with other uh, practitioners and researchers. Great. Yeah, I think it would be good. And I personally would like the idea of calling it Ramix Conversations. And I like this format of one main presenter that, that controls the session, how they do it. And then those of us who are interested can come and, and contribute and ask and talk. And we have, I have several offers for the next presentations. So Federico has said that he would be happy to talk about um, what he's been doing. So he's worked on a community currency game that he's played with communities before launching um, the currency. And as he mentioned, he's done that in Taiwan, he's done it in Italy, in Dublin, he's done it here in Finland, he's done it in a number of different places. So I think that might be quite interesting for us. So um, have you recorded all of this, Jeremy? I have. I was very nervous about that because I, when I stopped sharing my screen, I was like, please tell. I think it's recorded and I think it's on my computer. Um, if everything goes smoothly, I will, I will upload it to the mailing list. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, if people want to carry on chatting, they can, but I, I'm kind of... <laughs> currency no, out no, now so no, i'll say thank I, you and i'll say goodbye for me yeah i have to go my son has been banging on this door for the last 30 minutes he, he really wants me to play with him so i'm i think i'm also going to sign off um yeah. i'm just gonna but i just want to save some of these there's a lot of useful information in this chat because i know normally when you close these zoom meetings the information don't, in the chat don't for don't forget take him to kizania <laughs> yeah. yeah i won't forget I won't how forget. Can I, how can I save chat? Yeah, because I'm also wondering, because um, I've just- I've saved it. I've saved it, but if you want to, at the bottom of the chat, you will see it says file, and there should be three little dots. If you click on the dots, it should give you an option to save chat. Oh, okay, chat, yeah, save chat, okay. Yeah, I can find it. Thanks. Oh, that's great, that's good to know. So thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Just one quick question, Jeremy. We we didn't talk about this today. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know much more about the rural thing for me personally, but also mm -hmm. I'm interested to know about in South Africa, if there've been any uh, community currencies. Um, yes. not, not, not that I know of. I was in touch with a nonprofit before I came to Japan, but community currencies in Japan is few and far between. And for me, I mean, we, obviously we can't get into it now, but one community currency that I've personally started paying a lot of attention to is um, New Economics Foundation in Kenya, as well as what's happening with um, Banco Palmas, because I feel those kinds of initiatives, those kinds of projects are most suitable for creating a currency in South Africa. Most of the community currencies I know of in South Africa have been created by communities of, you know, like we said earlier, kind of woke individuals or, or, or a group of people whose, whose economic needs were not as acute. And th these were people that were in a situation where they could consider, you know, just kind of 
the community in a broader way. But I think what's happening in Kenya and South America, I think those kinds of currencies would be much more pertinent to what's happening in South Africa. But at the moment, there's nothing like that happening. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. じゃあまたさよなら。さよなら。ありがとうございました。はい、バイ。ロールさん。バイ。バイバイ。<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑>